you don't care. I think. Oh, well, it's a great way to start. You don't care. <laughs> I didn't say I didn't care. I just. I mean, I did say I didn't care. Welcome to Frame Rate. No, Cohen Brothers Brothers. We don't care. God damn, dude. We're just. We've lost all. We're not That's doing not true. good podcasts. That's not true. We care a ton. Yeah, I, I really care about these next two movies. We're the Cohen Brothers Brothers, and we care a ton. Well. Uh, I'm Michael Swain. I'm Abe Epperson, and this is the podcast where we talk about the Cone Brothers as brothers, no. and also we're brothers. <laughs> that, some of that is true. <laughs> we kind of talk about them as brothers, but mostly their movies as we chronologically go into their filmography. Which and is also now not true, thanks to the Buster Scruggs yeah, episode. Yeah, goddamn, nothing. It's ruined forever. We can't win. But today we're talking about 2000's Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? Yes, which is just one movie. Yes. You said two movies because we're because we do these in couples. In the right. uh, see behind the curtain, people. A peek behind the curtain. As always, we'll be discussing Oh Brother, Where Art Thou through three spectra, diegesis, pedagogy, and how do you do that? Mm. Uh, and we start with diegesis, which is basically what happened in the movie. What do you think? Like the yeah, stuff that happens scene. in the movie. Yeah, scene by scene, things that happen, and. Not what they mean necessarily, but like kind of plot stuff and like Without interesting. Too bogged down in, yeah. in every detail. We'll take little digressions into not what it means philosophically, but like what it means to the story and little things you might have missed. But ultimately, it's just a uh, play by play. Yeah. Uh, as Abe said, 2000, you got Clooney, Turturro, mm-hmm. and Tim Blake Nelson. God, yeah. New to the Cohen canon. At this point, yes, very much so. Well, Buster Scruggs himself now. Yeah. But uh, those are his only two Cohen roles, right? I believe you're right, yes. Okay. 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 <laughs> okay. Well, it seems like he's done more just because he's so indelibly, like, Delmar really made an impact on Oh, him. yeah. In both cases, but in this mm-hmm. case, he is so delightful. I mean, they're all delightful. Are they the big three, Everett, uh, Pete, and Delmar? Delmar yeah. being Tim Blake Nelson. Uh, they're all perfectly three stooges, but they're unique in their own way. Like, they all... They feel like cartoons because, like, Totoro's so tall and he acts mm-hmm. through his teeth. You know, like, Tim Blake Nelson's kind of... S- short and small stature and like acts through his eyes and when i say acts through it's like all of it, that like as a cartoon character that's throwing what an axe through his yeah. eyes <laughs> and uh, of course every Clooney acts Clooney from his hair from his hair <laughs> yeah. uh, let's start diegesis um, with just like or you had something else. well i was just gonna say yeah the the bros the c bros <laughs> the c bros j and e they have uh referred to this as a three stooges in a way uh, just like they referred to uh, Raising Arizona as sort mm-hmm. of a Looney Tunes. And you mm-hmm. can see that for sure. I would also add, so there's the classic comedic, sorry, I reminded myself of the Simpsons line, mm-hmm. itchy and scratchy form a dramaturgical dyad. <laughs> right. And there is the classic comedic dyad, which is Odd Couple, uh, Laurel and Hardy, yep. any buddy comedy, mm-hmm. Lethal Weapon. Um, and then there's the classic comedic triad, which is the Three Stooges, but also predates that, and there's many. It's even Fry, Bender, and Leela. Yeah. And so it's just interesting to think of them saying, well, we're going to do ours. It's going to be con men mm-hmm. in the, like, what are they, uh, Reformation period after the Civil War. Dust Bowl era. Yeah, exactly. And... It's it's delightful. Okay, you're right. Let's get into what happens. Yeah, so this is, uh, if you haven't watched it, you should go see it. It's, uh, a logline would be something along the lines that in the 1930s, deep south in Mississippi, mm-hmm. to be exact, escaped convicts seek for hidden treasure while being chased by a lawman slash demon. That's all that this is really about. But, of course, like any other Coen Brothers movie, there's a bunch of little tiny plots like, you know, Pater familias, uh, you That's know, more of a line than a plot, but, <laughs> but that's I know kind what of you a mean. plot like getting Holly Hunter back. Yeah, you know? and we should say because it's the first thing you see, but, the credits identify it as yeah. an adaptation. I didn't want to mention it that way oh. though, because I think about these Hayseed movies mm-hmm. is that the plots when you really shake them down are really simple. It's just like group of people want to get thing. You know, it's usually very simple and then they like fill it in with like this Americana vibe. That's right. one of the things I think this Which is why is. I bring up Futurama cuz it right. could be a sitcom if you totally. <coughs> Pardon. If you cut it up like they cut up Buster Scruggs, mm. 
this also could have been a serial, but with three recurring characters. Because mm-hmm. there's totally liftable sections. Yeah. There's even things where, like, of course, you meet Tommy, mm-hmm. the blues player, and then six episodes later, you'd be like, oh, he's back for the season finale. Right, exactly. Um, and I that makes sense also why, uh, in case you missed it, it's an adaptation of The Odyssey, and they shout it out as that incredibly loose adaptation of the odyssey they, like they're just grabbing like ah you look it's like, more like there's easter eggs that cyclops yeah, all of a sudden are about the odyssey right. yeah has the affectations of cyclops yeah but it is worth pointing out that the odyssey was also that like the odyssey to me is basically netflix's daredevil mm-hmm. it was a cool action story released mm-hmm. in sections that was like then that's all done all right forget yeah. that now this happens right and when we get into uh uh, it's a road it, movie. Yeah, when we get it, later in the podcast, we'll talk about that as well. But let's just dive right into the, the scene by scene. So it starts off, and it's uh, there's a chain gang, and they're breaking rocks. Um, in the hot noon sun. Yeah, I they like, fought the law, and the law won. Right, <laughs> Everett, Pete, and Delmar have escaped. We cut, we catch them in medias res as they're running in the tomato fields, mm-hmm. while the credits plays. The song is Big Rock Candy Big Mountain. Big Rock Candy Mountain. Uh, and they're hiding and running in unison, which is going to be important about how uh, you know you mentioned before about how they're very much the Three Stooges. I, it seems to be that they're running in unison. That so, they have decided that that's some advantage to getting away. It seems to be in time with the clinking of the chains, so they're like they won't hear right, us rustling right. when the chain when the pickaxes rather are swinging. Right. Yeah, and they do that a lot in this film. They slide in and out of frame with choreographed timing, mm. uh, like a Chuck Jones cartoon. Um, they chase, so they get away uh, a little bit. They chase the chicken and they eat it while on the run. Well, they hop a. That's next. Oh, okay. They, eat a they do the chicken before. first. Yeah. Okay. Then they hop aboard a ta- uh, train game. Freight train. Yeah. And they hitch up with some hobos for <laughs> very, just very, briefly. Sh- very briefly. One of the first good jokes in the whole thing. Everett says the first line, say, any of you boys smithies? Or if not smithies per se, were you otherwise trained in the metallurgical arts before straightened circumstances forcing you into a life of aimless wandering? And then because he's chained to Delmer and John Turturro's name's Pete, and he was the only one able to hop the train, and he assumed they yeah. just could, but they fall down. <laughs> he just gets, like, squeaked out the yeah, train. Which you looks know. like it would have killed Hilarious. him, but uh, it's amazing. I'm sure it just killed uh, some and stuntman. So we're, we're starting to solidify the idea that they are a group, but you're starting to feel like Everett's what are, the leader, and, or at least he's the talker. And what are their unique traits? Yeah. He's the talker. Pete's the very grim, serious, yeah. like emotional one. Yeah. And Delmer's the Philip J. Fry, essentially. Right. He's the dummy. So having having uh, not gotten on the train, they immediately discuss leadership, which mm. is so hilarious to me that these because they're I guess they're still connected, but it's like it's very important to them. And that's something we notice a lot with this group. It's like the superficiality of like something matters to them a little bit. And in this case, it's leadership. Who's in control? Who's running this crazy thing? And so uh, they have, of course, Pete, uh, who's probably the second most headstrong in the group played by John Turturro and George Clooney. I'd say he's the most headstrong. He's probably the most headstrong. He ultimately convinces Clooney of his opinion finally in the end. That's true. (laughs) But I mean... also, Delmar convinces him to get baptized. Just through his it's, sweet yeah. niceness. Yeah. Uh, but one, I, I love this joke. It's very um, Marx Brothers, which is just like, well, I think I should be the leader. Well, I think I should be with the leader. And then Delmar says, okay, I'm with you fellers. <laughs> so they, yeah, everyone votes for themselves and Delmar's unable yeah. to help. So we move on without knowing who the leader is, which right. is... You don't really need a yeah, leader. Uh, They're just bumblers. That one point, Everett fancy calls himself a tactician. Yeah, uh, that's a little important. Uh, but they yeah. get a lift from a blind man driving a handcar on the railway. Is what happens next. Yep. And he and tells them. In I just wanted to say in Odyssey terms because I will shout out the biggest references. Tyrese. He beats Tyrese. Yeah. the blind seer who appears at the beginning and tells Odysseus essentially not word for word prophecies exactly he, yeah but he also specifically tells him you're gonna get home but it won't be the way you want and right. you won't find what you seek which is mm-hmm. what happens here 
Yeah, exactly. He tells him, among other prophecies, that he's going to see a cow on a cotton house, <laughs> which comes to fruition later. That's to prove that the magic is real, I think. Yes. That's the setup. That it, yeah, needs, yeah. it needs something super specific. Supernatural. And also, when you first hear it, you go like, that's crazy. Uh, <laughs> and then you will find a fortune, but it's not the one you seek, which feels a little bit yeah. more like fortune teller. Like, yeah, that can be true if you just like... If you think hard about it, that can be true about yeah. anything kind of stuff. Anyway. Uh, they, I want to get the rest of that quote. Yeah. I cannot tell you how long this path shall be, but fear not the obstacles in your path, <laughs> for heaven has vouchsafed your reward. You shall follow this road, though it be long, even unto your salvation. And yeah. of course, that will all come true in, a, in manners of thinking. Uh, what happens next is the trio make their ways to the house of, and I want to get this right, Washington... Wash, Bartholomew Hogwallop. Hogwallop, Pete's <laughs> yeah. cousin. Pete's so cousin. we now know Pete's name is also yeah. is Pete Hogwallop. And it's introduced <laughs> because Wash's son uh, shoots at them when they're kind of entering, coming near yeah. the house, and tells them that he's supposed to shoot men with papers. Uh, quote, I nicked the census man. Delmar says, now there's a good boy. Or anyone from the bank or anyone from the government. Yeah. I think it's important to establish on the road over. Post-depression post, post uh, depression kind yeah. of, yeah. On the road over, uh, they basically know their chains are about to get knocked off. So this is the point where Everett reveals their the thing that keeps them together, mm. which is he claims to have stolen and stowed $1.2 million, and they're all in it together to go recover right. it before it gets flooded. Also during that period, uh, they go like, but how did that blind guy know so much about us? Also, it's weird that they don't help the blind guy push the cart. Did you think about that? Uh, I mean, they're yeah, assholes. I mean, I don't, they are assholes. <laughs> I mean, they're, they're all it's an chained old up. blind man. Yeah, I don't, I mean, at this point, you're just on for the ride because like, wh sure. who is he? What is he doing? So he's like, how do you know that stuff about us? And I love Everett goes, well, maybe he's psychic. You know, the blind can have extrasensory powers right, due right. to the deprivation of. But if he's psychic, he said we wouldn't find the treasure. He said we wouldn't get the treasure on account of our obstacles. And he goes, well, what does he know? He's just a blind old man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you kind of infer the treasure bit. It does not come out immediately. It's kind of over conversations. You infer there's a treasure. Mm -hmm. What is the treasure? You don't find out till like act three that it's he like says it's he hit an armored amount. car, but yeah, yeah. But let's get he, it all out there changing. so we don't have to keep referencing. Right, it. right, right. But um, that, so they that is the MacGuffin. Pete's cousin knocks their chains off. Right. And they have dinner there. And they have dinner, which is weak old horse that I want to, I <laughs> yeah. want to add. Uh, Wash says at one point, mm, looks like she's, Turned. Uh, there he goes, this is mighty fine eating wash. He says, yeah. really? I slaughtered this horse a week ago. I'm afraid she's turned. I'm afraid <laughs> she's turned. Uh, my, my favorite line in that scene is, because uh, Everett is still always looking for ways to care for his hair, and he goes, I suppose it'd be the acme of foolishness to inquire whether you have a hairnet. Well, there's a mess in Jan Bura. <laughs> Jan Bura. <laughs> Just the pure love of dialect on uh, display. Yeah, that's what really makes this thing shine, mm -hmm. personally. Is and the feels music. Like, yeah, the, the music. Sound. It's like all just doused in mm. Americana. Pete asks Wash about uh, family, as he do, uh, including his wife, which Wash responds, Mrs. Hogwop up and R-U-O. R-U-N-N-O-F-T, which is uh, to protect, I guess, the boy from hearing the reason, like the boy's not she supposed to know. But as we learn later, he, he does. Uh, as an e Did you notice as an evening activity, uh, they all listen to pass the Pass the Biscuits, Papio ba Daniel Flower Hour? Papio Daniel, yeah, Papio of course. Papio Daniel. Yeah. Uh, and they play You Are My Sunshine as Everett combs his hair. Yeah, mm -hmm. that, whole, that all happens, so we're kind of foreshadowing uh, the mass communicating that happens from Papio Daniel. Yeah. So they sleep in the barn that night. They immediately get turned in by the cousin. <laughs> so yeah. they get woken up in the middle of the night. And the, the place, hell you seen? Wash his kin. <laughs> yeah. They get uh, the cops basically burn down the barn that they're sleeping in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, Pete. I know he's kin, but they got this depression on. I'll kill you. My favorite thing is actually that uh, a joke I only got this time, maybe the 12th time watching it. Pete says... My pa always said, never trust a hog wallop, which he is also a hog wallop, yeah. as is his pa. Yeah, so exactly. So like, never don't trust, trust us. They are family. We're terrible. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, well, I, the, uh, 
the leader of the cops, who will be characterized as the devil throughout, is the drill instructor from Malcolm in the Middle. Who oh, I really? love so much. Yeah. Oh, wow. Uh, there's, uh, there's something that's interesting that I found is the, uh, in just terms of the comedy. Uh, this is where we have the famous line that said, damn, we're in a tight spot, yeah. said, uh, which is said four times mm. in the movie. Or four times in this scene, because uh, I didn't notice, or at least I couldn't remember, and it, when it happened, it made me smile, uh, which is that Everett says a distant fourth, damn, we're in a tight spot, in a wide... Off like, camera. Uh, like, you just hear, like, damn, we're in a tight spot. It reminded me <laughs> of, so good. like, uh, Wet Hot American Summer, honestly. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's amazing comic editing. Good job, Roderick James. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so they throw a torch up, which they immediately throw the torch back at the cops, which lights a wagon full of bullets. Mm. where they go that's, that's liquid fire that's, uh, that's how they're going to escape in wacky fashion yeah giving Wash's son time to help them escape also revealing that he knows that R-U-N-N-O-F-T phonetically as is Means what run. mom did run which is off. run away yeah. he also wants to run off yeah. um, but instead they because they're adults yeah. steal the car from him and make him go home right <laughs> and just take the car and he goes like I'll, I'll curse upon your name. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And they're like, go home and mind your pa. Right. Well, so they drive it for a while, but then it breaks down. Uh, so at the mechanics, Everett tries to buy, and I know this is your favorite. Tries to buy a car part. Scene, more yeah. or less, in terms of the one Comedy, of the lines. at least. Uh, at the mechanics, Everett tries to buy a Dapper Dan Man hair product, uh, and the engine's parts are two weeks away since they're in the middle of nowhere. Also... Dapper Dan. They don't carry Dapper Dan. They carry As, Fop. Yes. I don't and want I'll let fop. you tell it. God damn it. I'm a Dapper Dan man. <laughs> oh, you mean the last line? Well, yeah. Well, ain't this place a geographical oddity? Two weeks from everywhere. <laughs> I also love... Forget it. A dozen hair nets. I, also, I don't want Fop, damn it. I'm a Dapper Dan mm -hmm. man. And then the response by the shopkeep is, watch your language, young feller. This is a public <laughs> market. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Which, there's no one around. And right after it hard cuts to him, the way he tells them were fucked on the car yeah. front, like I couldn't find the car part, is, well, I swear it didn't look like a one-horse town, but try and find yourself a decent hair jelly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so this is when we realize there is a ticking clock because in four days, the Tennessee Valley Authority is going to dam a river or blow up a dam? They're going to blow really up a matter. dam, which will flood uh, an area of the river. Flood or, a particular flood area. Their, yeah. It's there the was river a, that's yeah. dammed up. There was a town that's been evacuated, and that's where Everett used to live, and he says that's where the treasure is. So that's why they're like, we're not going to make it in time on foot. Mm -hmm. What are we going to do about this we car problem? We got four problem? days. <laughs> so Everett reveals that he stole Watch's watch, uh, and so they can sell it to get a new car. Oh, this is great. Yeah. Which is great, because Totoro gives him one of the best droopy eyed to hate look you've ever seen. Like, yeah. one of his eyes is half open, and he's just so angry. Because he's so loyal. You can't. You stole yeah. my from again. Who's fixing to betray us? You didn't know that at the time, so I borrowed it till I did know. That don't make no sense. Pete, it's a fool who falls for logic in the chambers of the human heart. Yeah. So Pete, I realized his main trait is loyalty and hating traitors. Right. Yeah. yeah. So he hates... They're all opportunistic to some extent. But he, his overriding trait is loyalty and betrayal are the only two things he sees. Right, right, right. So like when his own cousin betrays him, he goes, I'll kill you. <laughs> and then when it's his cousin is betrayed, he goes, you betrayed my cousin. Yeah. Uh, I also love that Delmar, who's always been taking the kind of backseat role, literally yeah. being in the backseat of the cars too. Uh, he's... He's just such a kind man. He's just like uh, explaining like do, gopher. Ever? He's an ad, he's because they're eating gopher. So in the comedy grid, we often when we come up with these triumvirates as comedy writers, mm -hmm. uh, you try to mix it up and stay fresh. But they're simple. Like everyone should have two facets. So you could be like smart and mean, right? Or dumb and nice, or dumb and mean. And Delmer's definitely the dumb nice. Materia, yeah, link just archetype. like Fry and Bender are both dumb, but one's nice and one's mean. Yes, yeah. exactly. They both do dumb jokes, but Bender does. They're, I'm a terrible person. The three-way <laughs> diagram that makes that tri trio work. So uh, I love. Yeah, great evidence here is he compliments uh, Everett on his thievery, and then tries to feed him with a gopher on a stick. You got some light fingers, Everett. Gopher, and then yeah, I just as love, if it's a good plan. Yeah. yeah, no, thank you, Delmar. A third of a gopher would only arouse my appetite without bedding her back down. 
Oh, you can have it all. Pete and I already had one. We ran across a whole gopher village. Right. I was going to point out that like he was a little bit more stop and start earlier in that line yeah, because was. while that's happening... Uh, there's like a, uh, a they're, getting they're interrupted by the song of a Christian congregation uh, going to be baptized at the river. So it's like they're all mesmerized by the song and these people in these white you know shawls and yes. such that it's just like yeah yeah it's it's kind of a great moment because you don't know why and that's kind of what goes on in like things like Homer's Odyssey, which it's surprising to hear that they argue that they've never actually read it they just haven't yeah we'll talk about yeah, that later uh, I think. that they kind of nail here that kind of not necessarily any particular thing like uh like the locust eaters or something or lotus the siren eaters. lotus eaters this is the lotus eaters clearly yeah it clearly yeah it, it's it's they clearly get the aspect of like for some reason for some reason your heroes who usually are up to task are mesmerized by a song you know, happens which again comes, with the sirens, happens again yeah. with the sirens. Which I think is why they ultimately made the decision to make this a low-key musical, right. which it is. Right. Uh, like, it's not a full musical, but it kind just of like, is. Oh, dang. And yeah, I'll just say about the Lotus Eaters connection, I think it's a very interesting entry in the history of us trying to figure out what they think about fate and religion and metaphysics, because in the Odyssey, the Lotus Eaters... Lotus is like a deri- an opiate. You can derive opium from right. it. So it's them stopping in a field and being accosted by this like hippie love cult who just hang around naked all day because they're super chill because they, they just yeah. eat lotus because they found this huge field of lotus that grows. And a, he loses a bunch of his men who stop, who don't want to go any further right, and settle right. there. It's basically weed. So for <laughs> them, know, like, right. But it's funny. Yeah. It's like he lost some men to, uh, we passed a weed bush and, and some like, dudes nah, were like, I'm out, bro. Yeah. I'm going to bounce. <laughs> um, but that they make it evangelical Christianity and chanting and baptism is like a pretty heavy religion burn. Opiate of the masses. Opiate of the masses, yeah. quite literally. Yeah. Uh, and it gets who? It gets Delmer and Pete, but not Everett. Yeah. At the river, there's a brief song reprieve of as they're, uh, the, the priest is kind of dunking heads. Down that's the, the river to yeah, that's pray. the, Oh fathers, let's go, go down. down, which I think might be my second favorite song want? in this. Okay. Can we say our favorite and in unison? Well, yeah. Three. Two, one, man Killing Const- Floor Blues. Oh, shit, I forgot about that one. I was going to say Man <laughs> of Constant Sorrow because it's so joyous. But it is. like, Yeah, that one is, that's just the in, uh, instrumental uh, he guitar. He sings it one oh, verse on the of OST. it. No, no, no. Tommy sings a verse of it when they're sitting around the campfire, but they talk over him But singing. that's the one with the slide guitar. It goes, bam, yeah. bam. Yeah, that one's Hot really good. Hot times will drive you from do to do. do. Bam, yeah. Bam, 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 bam. yeah, that one's really good. Uh, but yeah, it's we get the first real discord of the group. Uh, you know, obviously they were talking about who's Threatening the leader. The friendship. But yeah. Everett responds like, well, I guess hard times flush the chumps. Everyone's looking for answers. and uh, He's a very smug atheist. <laughs> yeah, and Delron, Delmar runs to get baptized, and Delmar comes back and says, the preacher said, all my sins been washed away, including, including that piggly wiggly I knocked over in Yazoo. <laughs> Everett said, I thought you said you were innocent of those charges. Delmar says, well, I was lying, and the preacher said that that sin's been washed away, too. Uh, Pete, it's a straight and narrow from here on out, yeah. and heaven is my reward. Reward. So Pete, hearing this, also is buys in and decides to get he's baptized He's in the middle. Well. He's like, it can't... He literally says in the car yeah. later, it can't hurt, too. Can't hurt, too, but he's yeah. also like... He's kind of he's buying into it. He's excited about yeah, it at yeah. the moment, yeah. Because they both are, are kind of... They but both like, kind of talk about it like they've been saved and of course everett has to explain to delmer well Mm. see delmar the law won't care that you're baptized Mm. your criminal record is still intact so we kind of jump ahead but before we do uh they're they're driving now because they've bought they have to pick up their company but a company there's a little uh, tiny the company, the fellow uh, with the guitar. Come in, uh, uh, <laughs> but we see there's a short very it's just a shot. It's, I wouldn't call it even a scene. Uh, we see the lawman on their trail with his dog via a dapper Dan can next on the forest floor. So oh, where, sure. where they were before like the previous All throughout night, the cops track yeah. them. 
specifically. So they're driving now. They're still wet. So we know, like, so somehow they bought a car mm. and they're driving all in a matter of like 20 minutes. Because remember, this is like summer in Mississippi. Mm. So it's just magically teleported into a car or a pawn car. Like uh, that problem where the part was going to take two weeks was solved with money somehow. Right. I think the implication is they sold the watch and got a beater, like yes, got a new car. Yes, that's what they a new old car. About. Yeah. Uh, and Pete and Delmore are just talking about how they wish that, you know, ever got baptized. The group then picks up Tommy Johnson, a young black man who claims that at, he sold his soul to the devil last night at the crossroads that they find him at in exchange for the ability to play the guitar amazingly. Which, of course, is not from the Odyssey, although the Odyssey does often use crossroads imagery to represent similar themes. Uh, the famous blues musician, Robert Johnson, right. that's the as a PR tale. thing, yeah. said that he sold his soul to the devil, and that's how come he's so good at guitar. Yeah. So they're mixing and matching all kinds of myths of heroic proportion, including ones from real life. I think that's very interesting because mm -hmm. they really just want this thing to feel like a big fish almost, like a book of American tall tales, you know, right, put together. Right, yeah. right, um, So I, he, I love he that interaction them. where he says, like, uh, he, Elmar uh, introduces Pete and Delmar as these two soggy sons of bitches, mm -hmm. which because they're both wet. Uh, and then he also says, well, ain't it a small world, spiritually speaking? Beaton Delmar just been baptized and saved. I guess I'm the only one who remains unaffiliated. Right, because there's two people in the car who are on the side of Jesus and one who's uh, owned by the devil. Right. And Tommy says only two basic things, pieces of information. One, that the devil is white. And two that there's a radio station nearby that plays that pays money for singing in a can. Well, point of order, he doesn't just say the devil's white. He says the devil's white with empty eyes yeah. that reflect hellfire yeah, yeah, yeah. and travels with a big hound dog. And we'll talk more about that later, but this was the point where I realized, oh, that's that cop that's chasing them. Uh, and that will get reinforced throughout. There's more and more clues where you're like, yeah, he's the devil. Right. Um, but yeah, he redirects their adventure which is, as Abe said, every episode is basically just going to be a new force comes in and redirects them to an adventure. Right, right. And this one is, they need money to travel. And he says, there's a guy who'll pay you $10 to sing into his can, which means record a podcast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or, no, uh, if you sing good. Yeah. They're pressing records. They're yeah. yeah. At this point in time, anyone could go to the radio station. Cut and, a like, record, play, essentially. And if it's good music he goes like okay here's ten dollars and then they play it on the radio yeah exactly uh and this is i love this scene because not only does it have one of our very fra uh favorite uh coen brothers Cast, people yeah, yeah steven root. root uh who plays a very cross-eyed kane toten uh radio broadcast is he engineer is he blind uh i he's definitely doing lazy eye work but there's i just, don't there's like a plethora of people with eye problems in this he, movie. and he also <laughs> i think he's i think it's hinted at that he's blind because at one point ever it says there's a more of us and also we're oh, black he has to be they yeah. lie about being black and white based on getting more or less money yes yeah. so he can't see that well or he's entirely blind uh but Stephen Root helps them record a song as the Soggy Bottom Boys. Uh which I just realized that that's because they were just baptized, right? Right. He even now, off the top of his head, he has to make up a band name, and Everett is like mildly insulting Pete and Delmer. Right. And he just called them soggy sons of bitches. Yeah, Sue exactly. Tommy. Yeah. So, and this is where we get the uh, company, uh, company, the the fellow who plays the guitar. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Which is that for some reason they no, no one in this movie can get that accompaniment. That's right? universal. There's a guy on the radio who has nothing to do with them. Yeah. Who also can't pronounce accompaniment later. And I think yeah. it happens three times which as we find out as we ever do every time in this podcast they love rules of three mm -hmm. so, and sometimes rules of four if they can get away yeah. with it but if they're gonna make a weird mistake that's like that's weird they do it three times right. and then suddenly you're like ah well that's We're just yeah. that's just that explains it so that's where we hear uh, the title track Abe's favorite mm -hmm. Man of Constant Sorrow I agree it's in the running for best track yeah and they get 60 bucks instead of 40 bucks. He's got to be blind by <laughs> claiming that there's six of them six when there are only them. four. Yeah. And on the way out, they pass Pappy O'Daniel, who we heard on the radio earlier when they were in Wash's house. Yeah. I love how endearing it is because we hear for the third time now 
that that I think it's Delmar that says like there's a guy in there who will pay you to sing again like they're just so like excited about man America's great because you can just walk around and make money yeah and he's just like Pappy could not care less right right Pappy says don't tell me how to court the electorate we're not one at a time and here we're mass communicating right so clearly he's tapped into the idea that the radio is a new propaganda platform Mm. and this introduces the b-plot that i don't want to necessarily pause every time or we can but throughout there's an ongoing senate race or governor's race Mm. between papio daniel the incumbent and homer stokes the guy who claims that he's gonna clean everything up sweep the nation yeah or sweep in a sweep in mississippi clean classic like incumbent versus new guy new guy claims incumbents crooked Incumbent claims, I'm traditional. Yeah. Did you notice that? Uh, so he has his acolyte who might be his son? I, I, I think don't, it's his son. Yeah, I think it's his son. That he says, um, that's Governor Menelaus. Menelaus, yeah. Right. What, another Odyssey reference. Well, another Odyssey reference, but because he says, that's Governor Menelaus past Biscuits Papio Daniel. Yeah. So what is, go- so his name is Menelaus Papio Daniel? I think so. So, uh, Pass the Biscuits is his nickname in quotes. Menelaus, also is, Pass the Biscuits, Pappy, oh, Daniel. Or is it Pass the Biscuits, Pappy, and then he just oh. known as Pass the, uh, just known as Pappy, oh, Daniel. I, we never hear his never full understand. commercial, but maybe his tagline is kids creepily going, I mean, it's the late 30s, right. Pass the Biscuits, Pappy, <laughs> you know, yeah. that's his nickname. But anyway, they're mass communicating. <laughs> yeah. And meanwhile, we follow our guys, of course. They camp out for the night. And right. Tommy plays, Tommy hard, plays Kill Hard Time Killing Blues. Floor Blues, which if you my haven't heard song. it, go to Spotify or wherever. It's such a great track. Now in my life watching it definitely reminds me of the first time Lewin Davis plays Hang Me, Oh, Hang Me. And yeah. you're like, oh, shit. Yeah. <laughs> the Coen brothers have incredible taste in music and can direct the right. production of a music scene. So flawless. And uh, yeah, between Which is a Carter, separate set of skills. Yeah, between Carter Burrell and T Bone Burnett, they mm-hmm. both yeah. have Burr and the, Burr. <laughs> yeah, they both have the ability to just find crazy great musicians and do uh like anything from a huge orchestra to a you know chamber music with four pieces to just a guy and a guitar. And T Bone Burnett and, is famously like the Quentin Tarantino of music, right. so he'll go like he's the music nerd, he'll go like and you're going to want this song. Uh, I have it. It's only on this pressing yeah. from 1912. Yeah. And, and they're like, like, that is the best song I've ever and heard. And we'll talk about how the Soggy Bottom Boys are actually kind of in the same way of like boy bands in the 2000s. Yeah. We're formed together. He kind of did a boy band thing. But anyway, uh, they're talking about like what they're, they're reminiscent about the future. It's the first heart <laughs> scene where it seems at all like these three guys kind of like each other a little right. bit. Right. They talk about feather beds and silk sheets and what they're going to do with the loot. Pete's going to be a mater d and need all the swells. <laughs> and there's kind of like a t- like there's a star in his eye when he goes yeah. like all my meals for free. Like he's these are simple men who just want like a little piece of simplicity that they can call Delmer their own. just wants to buy back the farm that his family got foreclosed unfairly yeah. upon by a predatory lender. And that's why he robbed the Piggly Wiggly. So yeah. like Delmer is the guy from Hell or High Water. Like right. he's not even, his crime is just, it's a Robin Hood crime. Yeah. yeah, yeah he yeah. shouldn't even be in prison metaphysically. And he <laughs> says, so he can buy back his family farm. You ain't no kind of man if you ain't got land <laughs> you yeah. know it's and just then, so and then of course i think everett, this is the verse tip who's off, a, a tactician self-described doesn't have a plan this is the verse tip off that everett's even the first time i saw the movie this is when i went well everett's lying about the treasure mm-hmm. because the, he goes they go what do you want to do everett and he goes oh oh i uh i haven't thought of it and they're like that's weird yeah, usually. Did, why'd you steal it? Pete says, very good point. <laughs> What'd you have in mind when you stole it in the first place? Uh, no plan in particular. <laughs> yeah. right. Which they point out is odd. Um, oh, I love this. So they decided to not sleep in a bar. I just noticed that this time. Every time the cops chase them, the exact interaction is always the same. But because they decided the stars are nice tonight and we'll sleep outside... They wake up in the middle of the barn already on fire because they didn't sleep in the See, barn. See, I thought I thought it was different. I didn't read that the stars oh, okay. were out. I read that it was just that they slight they made a slight improvement to their plan. Like they're getting Maybe. a little bit better. It's not the greatest plan. They're still yeah. 
doing whatever is necessary to allow the cops to follow them. They haven't solved the problem of being fugitives. Well, did you but, also notice, because this time they're technically not in a tight spot because they're right. hidden, uh, but he still says in the exact same Delmar intonation, says, uh, damn, they found our car yeah. instead of we're in a tight spot. Well, actually, uh, Delmar says, damn, we got a skedaddle. <laughs> right, right, right. But Clooney says, damn, yeah. they found our car. <laughs> right, right, right. So it's just, yeah. Like they're we're not just in going a tight... auto run away. Exactly. They're, again, they're in cartoons. They're Looney Tunes. Uh, 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 it's also the third time that R-U-N-N-O-F-T is spoken. Yes. In the, in and then the here comes yet another wild swing from left field where magically their lives just change direction right. by chance. So the next day they're walking on the road. Because they lost their car again. And uh, bank robber Babyface Nelson picks them up because he's in a hurry. And uh, he's asking for directions. And they're just ta- taking too much time giving directions to Itabina, which is where he wants to get. Because Babyface Nelson at this point is trying to hit uh, multiple banks in multiple towns. Three banks in two hours. Yeah. Gone for the record. And uh, so now they're unwittingly involved in the string of heists that Nelson <laughs> is apparently trying to accomplish. Um, it's a lot like playing an Assassin's Creed game. Have you played any of those? Right, right, right. Where, where it's, it's like side quest in the middle of your quest. But also in those games you meet in the American Revolution one, it's like who should turn around the corner but Benjamin Franklin. Right, right. Like they randomly meet so many important people from this period right. or their fictional analogs. Right. Like the idea that you would run into Robert Jordan and then pick him up to hitchhike, and then also, R- or Johnson. Johnson, yeah. And then also meet Babyface Nelson picks you up to hitchhike. Right. Is bizarre. Right. Uh, I love also that, like, Robert Nelson Jordan, is clear. Sorry. We're painting, we're painting this uh, picture of Babyface Nelson also because, like, he's clearly involved in just this is for him it's not for the money the money is like literally unfurling in his bags going out the window and when he shoots at the cops he's announcing how big he is he uh hates cows more than coppers for some reason so he decides to shoot at them and then the cops hit the cow that's running through the road and, and get they get away. Yeah. Uh, it's just insane to me. Like, As cash this guy flies, is just being a piece of shit, but also yeah. like it's so inherently clear that he w- wants to be a big man. Also, as Cash flies out the window and Delmer says, friend, some of your folding money's come unstowed. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so they... Uh, I think he's manic depressive, personally. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. I think it comes back later. No one says that term. Later. But... Yeah, 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 exactly. No one says it, but uh, it's clearly what's happening because in the next scene, Babyface has now brought them into we a We robbed bank, a bank at Itabina. And uh, the trio now is an accomplice. Uh and I love this line. He says, remember, Jesus saves, but George Nelson withdraws. And then he like cackles like yeah. a maniacal And everything's devil fine till the most delightful old woman I've Aww. ever seen on yeah. film goes, I think that's baby face Nelson. <laughs> and that <laughs> shakes baby face to the core. Because you cannot call him baby face because babies are small men. Yeah. He wants to be a big, big he, man. Yeah, and he's hard and criminal. Uh, so he hate, he despises... The cops call him Babyface. Yeah, he despises that name and is overcompensating, uh, which is what's, I think, dealing with his rash actions. And it throws him... Just being called Babyface throws him into like a Tuesday Suicides ecstasy right. withdrawal depression. <laughs> right, he just becomes l- laconic. Dead inside, yeah. yeah. I love uh, Delmer around the fire while they're all counting the fat stacks of cash. That sure was fun, George. Almost makes me wish I hadn't been saved. <laughs> Robin Banks. I can sure see how a fellow would derive a lot of pleasure and satisfaction from it. Mm-hmm. It's okay. <laughs> like, yeah. That's his response. So, uh, <laughs> well, so, and then he just leaves. He, he just wa- walks into the night. And he like mumbles and hands them a few stacks of cash. Like, I guess you could hear. Yeah. And then he leaves. He just walks into the woods. The next morning, uh, well, I guess actually, yeah, the next Some morning, we cut time to indeterminate time later. A farmer watches as a propaganda truck passes for Pappy's rival, Homer Stokes, drives specifically past the wheat field near the radio station uh, where the radio man brokers a deal with some form of producer who's mm-hmm. saying essentially that the Soggy Bottom Boy single has now become an overnight sensation. Uh, the producer also fails to remember the word accompaniment. <laughs> right. Also, we get, it's clear now that they have warring songs for their campaigns. Right. Papio Daniels was uh, You Are My Sunshine, 
and Homer Stokes' is, is keep on the sunny side. Mm-hmm. And I love that they're so... so I think that's so a commentary similar. about how yeah. the politicians are all the same. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because you hate Pappy O'Daniel. He's like an outsized villain. Right. Played amazingly by Charles Durning. Yeah. We double-checked this time. Yeah. Uh, oh, I remember what we never corrected. Let's what? take the time now. Uh, a very key support player in the Cohen canon is Peter Stormare. Sto- yes. That, yeah. We said Stormare a lot, and it's Stormare, and it's he Stormare. deserves that. Yeah, yeah, he deserves that. Um, but anyway, Homer Stokes is immediately also problematic because his whole campaign is friend of the little man, and he has a little person mm-hmm. that he's just constantly problematic about. He's pro- using him as a problem. Yeah, like, yeah. isn't that right, little buddy? You're so little. Look how cute right. he is. Vote yeah. for Homer Stokes. <laughs> it just rubs the- you the wrong way. Right, right, right. Also later. <laughs> well, we'll get there. Yeah, we'll get but there. I'm saying like yeah, you yeah. already are suspicious of yeah, them. Yeah, both of them. You're that, like, yeah. I don't like these politicians, which is kind of like an honesty thing to do too. It, yeah, uh, it that's doesn't true. trust the people who are rich. It's very every man. Uh, He's constantly hitting various islands where different yeah, evil kings and reside. And people's silver tongues are usually portrayed as you know. And of pe- course, devils. yeah, that's why they're stopping the radio station. We now know. Oh, both campaigns are using mass communicating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but also that these guys don't know that they're a huge success. That's the and big singers. reveal. That's this, yeah. the bigger reveal. Um, so yeah, uh, Stephen Root tells Stokes that. <coughs> oh no, Stokes tells Stephen Root. That Soggy Bottom Boys is the equivalent of like, bye, 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 bye. Yeah, yeah, exactly. From that era. Yeah. <laughs> bye, bye, or bye. Toxic. <laughs> like you mentioned, boy bands, <laughs> and I agree. <laughs> bye, bye, bye. He is, he's like, Housewives love the Soggy <laughs> Bottom Boys, and this song is the number one pop hit <laughs> to drop your badonk to. Yeah, that's true. And I want to sign them on a contract to make that my new campaign right, song. Right. Uh, there are badonks to be dropped. Specifically, Stephen Root goes, Really? I didn't know it was doing so well. And yeah. he goes, the record's just going through the goddamn roof. Whole damn state's going AP. <laughs> AP, yeah. Uh, so the... Uh, oh, oh, sorry. What, and he said, one of my favorite Stephen Root deliveries in the whole thing. Unless this is about... No, no, no. Okay. You go ahead. Is he goes, uh, we got to get them signed to a long-term contract and use the momentum of this song to help us beat that competition. And Stephen Root goes, oh, my, oh, yes. Man. We got to beat that competition yeah. <laughs> like he doesn't care he doesn't even, at all this is yeah. the first time he's heard of the competition <laughs> that there's competition yeah, yeah. <laughs> but he's just we got to board. beat that competition so simultaneously <laughs> the group is walking on the road again because they've lost the car to baby face Tomer uh, steals a pie from so a windowsill. So this window is the cell. second car that they've lost. Because apparently this is a Chuck Jones cartoon. <laughs> right. So yeah, they steal pie, pay for the pie. Uh, and they also, while this montage is happening, this is the all oh, fly away, fly away. Uh, they missed the article, which I didn't notice until this time. At they, they're burning newspapers. The shot blows and, my mind. And yeah, the first page uh, talks about, like it, ta- it talks about like, it's a state of the union of everything that's happening in this movie. The front page of the paper is about the dam. The yeah. dam. Then you also see the fact that there's an election on. The front page burns yeah. away. And the last one is that uh, the Soggy Bottom Boys' success is in the paper. And they're just burning it like fire. Yeah. So whenever you are writing your screenplay, filmmakers, and you stop in the middle to say, let's just have the main character in VO go, how did it get to this point? The Omega strain is in the wrong hands and I only have 12 <laughs> hours. Remember the fucking shot where the Coen brothers recap all the plots with a newspaper that burns a page at a time in a fire. Right. In a matter of like eight seconds. Yeah. You so get caught good. up with like four things. Uh, they hitchhike. Uh, but they have to hide when they see the chain gang drive by, which is just a great little touch that they they like, feel guilty. They feel guilty, yeah. but also they don't want to get caught. Or a like few, survivor syndrome. A few more days also. pass. Uh, they're walking towards the treasure. Uh, so we get the feeling we're at like one or two days left. Before. Halfway to the treasure. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, he buys Dapper Dan. They steal a car. So they're on their third car now. Which is weird because I thought Babyface seemed to give them enough money that they could have bought another car. But right. But they were hitchhiking because I guess they had to find a car. But then here they are stealing a car from a market. They're thieves. It's station. easy to imagine off camera that their money pile mm-hmm. goes up and down and up and down. <laughs> it doesn't matter because... 
uh, as soon as they get the car, they're immediately once again taken aback by the by scene magic. of three women washing clothes in a river and singing. Pete has uh, the best hearing, apparently, because yeah, he just starts just like flipping out. Of flipping the car. out, <laughs> yeah, biting on his hat. You know, just they're acting like Wolfie from Hanna Barbera. Mm-hmm. You know, like it's just. As you'd as you'd expect out of a nineteen thirties yeah. kind of hayseed movie. And as far as I know, the two the most casual like people who barely know the Odyssey, mm. the two that they went, Oh, is John Goodman has one eye. Uh, oh, yeah. Cyclops. Cyclops. And this one. I bet they're the, the so, sirens. They're those sirens. Yeah. yeah. The sirens, <laughs> as they call them in So this these movie. are of course they beautiful them, women who sing right. so beautifully that you dash yourself upon the rocks. And it's kind of magical or mystical because you get the feeling that the song is entrancing them, but they're also drugging them with corn whiskey. The point is they lose consciousness. And they're also just like horny guys yeah, who horny find guys. these women by the side of the road. Upon waking, Delmar finds Pete's clothesline perfectly in the shape of a man next to him. One of my favorite things is like, because... The heart? Yeah, the heart. I mean, that's just amazing. But also, if you notice, uh, when you look at the three shots, because they show like shots of the camera on the ground looking at the feet, all three of them exact same composition. Mm. The only difference is that uh, Pete is not in his clothes, obviously, because right. he's gone, but his hat is also overturned and mm-hmm. upside down. And then, yeah, we have this reveal that, like, they think that they took him or they, like, disappeared him. Tell and they're witches. Says they left him his heart. <laughs> and, but then they start seeing right where his heart in, in his chest, it starts beating or it looks like it's beating. Uh, uh, it's revealed that it's just a toad. So he's convinced now that the sirens transformed Pete into a toad, screaming, them sirens did this to Pete. They I loved him up and turned him into a horny toad. Yeah, I think his idea is he was horny, which is a sin, and right. his punishment is therefore he right. turned into a right. horny toad. Uh, from this point on in the film, he talks to the toad as if it's Pete. <laughs> uh, yeah. So back in the car. Also, oh my God. I don't know if it was an improv, but it's such an uncoen moment that seems straight out of like something we would cut in. Right. How this scene ends. Oh yeah, yeah. Where I'm pretty sure Tim Blake Nelson legitimately slipped on water while saying a line. Right. Or that's what they were going for, and they nailed it because he goes, "Everett, what are we gonna do?" And he falls. Yeah. yeah. And as he falls, they just hard cut to the next yeah, scene. Yeah. Just like ah, oh, these guys. Like he's literally falling back into the water yeah. as it cuts out. <laughs> and then uh, they're back in the car and. Everett says, I'm not sure that's Pete. And this is all delivery, but it's so funny. Yeah. Of course it's Pete. Look at him. And he like puts the frog up to his face. Reminded me of planes, trains, and automobiles. Right. Holly yes, Hunter in Raising great. Arizona. Yeah. I love him so much. So much. much. <laughs> yeah. uh, and they're so, so at this point, we got to find some kind of wizard what can change convinced him back. that they need to find a wizard <laughs> to turn him back. Uh, but they go to a fancy restaurant. They put the toad in the shoebox. Uh, Delmar wants to keep the shoebox uncovered, as Pete would think that they're ashamed of him. But Elmar says it's obviously some kind of judgment on his character. So even Everett is now allowing that it's not just a no. It's not just that's a toad. That's not Pete. He's right. now being like, even if it was Pete. So that's right. kind of so Everett kind of does believe in this mystical thing a Which little bit. Which sets us up for an arrested development joke. Which is, he goes, well, it's because Pete was fixing to fornicate. And then, of course, mm. as the cute waitress gets an earshot, this is like a Curb Your Enthusiasm joke. Yeah. Delmer loudly goes, well, we too, you and me, we was fixing to fornicate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. And so are people on And Clooney's like, just like, uh, we'll take lunch, you know. And yeah. uh, here's the best, here's, oh, I love this introduction, is so is the way we're introduced to John Goodman, who plays the Cyclops character, a.k.a. Big Dan Teague. Um, the, when, when Everett pulls out his wad of cash Uh and starts flipping between the bills, you see John Goodman's ears prop up as if the sound of money is heard by the Cyclops and can immediately, who is a Bible salesman that we soon learn is immediately attracted to money. And is not a real Bible salesman, but is a mugger. It's just a, yeah, yeah, essentially just His a cover is I'm a Bible salesman. So he invites them for a picnic lunch. They oh, talk did you, about I just want to say, did what? you notice? Because I don't know why this even excites me. I should be sad. But I've never, ever found a visual flaw in a Cohen frame. And when your eye is trained for it, most movies have dozens constantly. Right. There's a diopter shot in his intro where John Goodman's really close in focus and there in focus in the back, mm. and his shoulder has double shoulder around it. 
Oh. Like the diopter error. They couldn't get it. Fuck you, Joel. You that's, done fucked that's up, on, Ethan. That's, this podcast is over. That's on Deacon's. No I, wonder. It's Deacon's fault. It's true. Amateur. I can't amateur. stay mad at Roger. Nah, Roger, you're too good. Yeah, so he, uh, Big Dan Teague, who, as I said, people, he wears an eye patch, so most people will know now this is the Cyclops, <laughs> He's the Cyclops. part of the Odyssey. Basically, it's amazing how even Everett is so well scammed, given that they're con men. Mm. He immediately, he's like, hey, I'm a stranger. How are you doing? You want to pay for my lunch and go to a secluded space with me? And he goes, sounds good, Big Dan. Sounds good. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I love how Everett's just like, all the way into like when he's, when Delmar's getting the shit beat out of him. He starts beating he's Delmar like, with a tree branch. Yeah, what does he say? Uh, uh, what's going on, Big Dan? <laughs> like, yeah, like, just eating his corn. Big Dan goes, I'm going to teach you the real lesson now and starts beating Delmar with a log. Yeah. And he's like, I don't get it, Big Dan. <laughs> yeah. And I love that Big Dan is just, who's, who's just finished telling them about a lesson in psychology, which is just about, quote, assessing your clients. But really what he means is he's just like, I could tell that I could take advantage of you. I'm big and I can beat the shit out of you. Which is great. You have a real way with people, Big Dan. How perceptive. You can beat up people smaller than you. Yeah, and Dan (laughs) decides to, Big Dan decides to yell in the scuffle with uh, Delmar and Big Dan. Uh, It's all about the money, boys. That's it. (laughs) And I just thought that that's, that's his only like thesis statement is that like, other than what he thinks, because he usually talks about how people talk about Although him he turns or how out, people act. It's the yeah. one time that he's like, you now know what it is, and this is the reason for it. It yeah. reminds me of Barton Fink. Although he seems like he truly believes in the ethos of the KKK, or like, right. why would he be a member well, yeah. who's defending he's also, it? So, so it's weird. Yeah, he's weird. He's, he's, Cause like, he's just supposed to see, be seen as a fairly A evil. ravening monster, because yeah. like, if you track it... it like at the KKK scene, I don't even understand why he is so mad, you right. know? So but he, uh, he, he specifically says, yeah, y'all seen the last of Big Dan Teague, which we haven't. Mm-hmm. Yeah, also, he, remember, he also was, he was looking toad. at the shoebox because I think that's where he thought all the money was. Mm-hmm. But when he sees it's just a toad, he squishes the toad to death. Delmar freaks out because he thinks it's still Pete. Uh, and uh, so, yeah. They keep hitchhiking back of a hay truck, and now they've learned. They've <laughs> he steals their third car. They have now the first one broke down. The second one's the cops got, and then the third, third one, one Dan Dan steals. Dan. It's a very Lebowski yeah. through line with the cars. But now that they're hitchhiking again, mm-hmm. in the back of a truck, they pass another chain gang, and this time Pete is there. Yeah, and stares at them like you Everett fucking says, assholes. Pete got a brother. The heat must be getting to me. Yeah. Uh, The sheriff is actually, yeah, has clearly already caught Pete and is about to hang him is a scene that happens before they drive by. Yeah. So this is not the first reveal of Pete being taken. But um, So Pete clearly pulled a a Manafort and rolled over. Right. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Um, The next scene is that Homer gives a speech to Everett's hometown, the servant of the little man, uh, to grasp the broom of reform and sweep this state clean. Uh, and then he introduces the Warby gals to sing for Homer's caucus, which Everett recognizes as his ex-wife's maiden name. They sing, since we're tracking this, in the highways, in the hedges. It's that one. Yeah. Uh, That's the carpet After they finish, scene. he tells the kids, or no, uh, yeah. Uh, he tells the kid. the kids tell No, the him, kids tell him, you can't be our daddy. The mother was, yeah, you were hit by a train and he has a no bow, soon to be married, Uncle Vernon T. Waldrip. Yeah, but I also love, He's there's repeated people just not accepting, he goes, but I'm your daddy, like, look at me, and they go like, God, they have so much fun with that You're not our daddy, daddy was hit by a train. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and this is where we, uh, of course, introduce he's bona fide, he's a suitor, uh, which is just, you know, once again. Let's get this pattern down, yeah, because there's one sequence I especially like. He's a suitor. Mama says he's bona fide. Does he got a ring? Yep, she had it tested. She says it's bona fide. He's a suitor. Next week, he'll be daddy. Nuh-uh, I'm your daddy. I'm the goddamn paterfamilias. But you ain't bona fide. <laughs> I like that run a lot. Yeah, and speaking of, like, I guess, runs of, like, the game that you're talking about mm-hmm. where everyone just... Repetition of phrases, reason, moving around. Yes, yeah. and we get that with paterfamilias, but, uh, like... She yells at her kids at one point, that's not your daddy, he was hit by a train. My favorite part of that like three, four beat arc is that 
the be- only good thing you ever did for those gals was get hit by that train. Which he didn't. <laughs> Which he didn't. Yeah. So that's right before the cartoonish fight with Vernon and But uh, yeah, I think Everett. especially in comedy, we should pause and point out like one of their superpowers that we want to underscore time and again is they'll have a scene where there's, let's say, 20 lines, but those <laughs> lines are comprised of the components of five lines. Right. Moved yeah. around all in different ways. Right. And it, it works so well. It, Just like the Lebowski... Are you afraid of coitus? I came about my rug, so you are afraid of it. What, coitus? Yeah. <laughs> like what, that same technique is right. on display. It's also, there's something about like when you really do something that's weird or you have some, a, some language or you have some syntax of language that a character uses that you're like, that's not really believable. Mm-hmm. Uh, it just, it's so clear that as a screenwriter, you can just, we'll just do it three more times and now you'll just, all people will think that that's just an Part affectation of the, universe. of the character. And it lets you know we're in the Cohen cartoon world. Yeah. Like, we're heightened now. Speaking of which, uh, and just sheer love of not saying things the way you've heard them said in movies before. Right. When he asks, where is my estranged wife, Penny? Short for... Is that right? Penny? Yeah, yeah Penelope, Penelope. Right, of course. Yeah. The wife in the Odyssey. They say, she's at the five and dime buying nipples. Just such an interesting thing to be doing. Right. That is so of the period. I would never ask, where's Abe? And have someone go, he's at the five and done by nipples. nipples. And yet, I want that on my gravestone. Yeah. It's Michael Swaim. He's wonderf- at the five and dime by nipples now. <laughs> <laughs> just wonderfully archaic. Yeah, just uh, great archaic language. So, including, he, he, yeah. <laughs> sorry. Oh, well, when he's <laughs> fighting with her, also, I love that this is her standard for why she had to pretend they have no father and he's dead as he goes like what's he got i don't got and she says vernon can provide for them and pay for their clarinet lessons right. <laughs> that's such a specific <laughs> he couldn't afford clarinet lessons so fuck him and yeah. god it's i mean holly hunter is Why so you lying perfect succubus. It's, <laughs> she's so perfect it's just like raising arizona where it's yeah. just like i'm gonna this is exactly what this is exactly the way it is, and like I'm, oh, he's counted. She's counted. Right. Ten. So you in know. the Odyssey, he came back, and there were a million suitors, and he had to murder them all. In this movie, all the suitors are represented by Vernon T. Waldrop, a dandy who looks like Jamie Kennedy, who basically does f- old timey fisticuffs with oh, yeah. Clooney and hands him his ass. Oh yeah. And like. Do you remember how impactful the gunshots felt in 310 to Yuma? Yeah. I feel like this fight scene needs... The sound editing in this fight scene, this fight is more intense than like Born Supremacy or James Bond. When <laughs> Clooney gets clocked, you're yeah. like, oh, that was meaty. It's also... <laughs> Clooney's really good at being a clown. And like getting hit and shaking when he gets it hit off. And yeah. the, the single shake and like the eyes recoiling and like regaining focus, like he's nailed that. Oh, he's so good at showing pain on his face and then pulling it back together. Yeah. Yeah. Like, he's just flabbergasted that it hurts so much trying to overcompensate. Like you get such a... Read from his yeah. face in this. That he, he really the Coens routinely face. take Clooney to a next level place that I don't Just, think he's at elsewise. Mm-hmm. Like the double takes, and I'm going to do a whole speech about the triple take and intolerable cruelty that he right, manages. Right. But uh, back on track, he gets uh, the bum <laughs> rush. The most amazing like an extra oh. throws him out and says, and stay out of Woolworths. Yeah, he looks like a human moose. Like Alan Chenoweth, <laughs> again, Best Bravo. casting director Bravo. in the business. That man is perfect for that. Stay moment. out of the Woolsworth. Uh, so then they're watching a movie, I guess, uh, which uh, the Chang Gang is brought into. The- oh, that's I thought that that was a weird break where they're like, "Well, we have no forward momentum now. We're Let's go to a movie. a movie." Well, it's yeah. like a, it's a hayseed movie. It's yeah. just like, "What's up with these?" You or like know, Bob ruffians. Hope on the road to yeah. Damascus. What's next? I don't know. <laughs> they go and watch a movie picture. Uh, so. The chain gang is brought in to watch the movie where they actually see Pete, who says, do not seek the treasure, since he acts through his teeth, and also since he told the sheriff about it, and it's an ambush. Uh, Of course, (laughs) Del Mar doesn't really listen to this. He's more, he has more thoughts about, we thought you was a toad. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Which means nothing to Pete, so he just repeats, do not seek the treasure But Pete tells him it's a bushwhack, they're fixing an ambush, Mm -hmm. don't seek the treasure over and over. I think it's important to note that before that, 
they were commiserating about how women can't be trusted because yeah. of the shit with his wife. Yeah. Just because I think at this point, it should be clear to Delmer that there's no treasure, but he's just so dumb right. that he's still just hanging out with this dude right. who clearly, George Clooney is now operating as if the treasure is not a priority now that they found his wife. But I do like the line, uh, Delmer, I'll tell you this, woman is the most fiendish instrument ever devised to bedevil the days of man. Bedevil the days of man is fun to say. Mm, ever yeah. devised to bedevil the days of man. <laughs> that, is, that is a good line. Um, so now they know it's a bushwhack. Uh, that the treasure will have cops waiting at it. And then, oh, yeah, we get more of the B-plot with Papio Daniel basically just saying... There's trouble, yeah. They, our campaign is failing. We have to try harder. His advisors are basically saying, like, we need something, and they can't think of anything. Do you agree with me that this is the one week... These scenes with Papio Daniel, they're really Three Stooges? Like, the bits are like... His, his advisors. advisors are cartoonishly stupid, so he hits them with his hat. Yeah. I didn't yeah. find them funny. These, this, these are like the weak spots for me of the movie. Yeah, I mean, there's a lack of charisma, I think, in the performances and in the writing. They're, they're just generic bumpkins. It's just like baby Huey they're, is dumb and the guy yeah. hits him. Yeah. <laughs> but I think they're, only, they're supposed to be that. I think they're supposed to be... I know. Yeah, boring in that way. Yeah, and Three Stooges doesn't make me laugh either. Yeah, they're they're not the Stooges. Not they're just the tea. window dressing of yes. Stooges. They're they're, they're more somewhere. like that Looney Tunes with the big guy and the little guy, and the little guy always gets mad and hits right, the big right, guy. Yeah. Um, but anyway, let's so let's move right on. Although they did remind me of ah, never mind. Let's move right on. Later, crash, that night. thunder, crash, storm. Yeah, uh, Peter Storm Mare. St- <laughs> Well, later that night, they sneak into Pete's holding cell and free him. As it turns out, the women have uh, dragged Pete away and turned him into the authorities. The sirens. Not turned, the sirens, not, not into a toad. Nothing obviously. supernatural happened. Yeah. They realized he was a criminal. They got him naked, and they turned him in for and the bounty. it's revealed under torture that Pete gave away the treasure's location to the police. And interestingly, which is why I think loyalty's his whole be- being, he's racked with guilt about it. Like, way more than these two people deserve from him. He's, like, literally praying, God, forgive me or strike me dead. Right. Because the worst thing in his mind is someone who lies to his compatriots and betrays them. Right. (laughs) Which is, it's also played for, like, because halfway through the scene, it completely changes. Because then Everett, who's like, ah, you're such a nice guy and you're saying all this stuff. It's to set up how pissed he's going to be. Yeah, he moves, he's so moved that he confesses that there is no treasure and he made it up to convince the guys he was chained to to escape with him in order to stop his wife from getting married. I do like when he's sad, he says, so the self-loathing thing is, must be the hog wallop in my blood. Ooh, my blood. <laughs> makes me a betrayer. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. But to this, Pete is enraged at Everett because uh, he had two weeks left on his original sentence, so he must serve 50 more years. I only had two weeks left. With the added time from our escape, now I don't get out until 1987. <laughs> Right, right. I'll be 84 years old. And Delmer happily goes, oh, I'll only be 82. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I also fucking love Delmar. Delmer catching up with Pete is one of my favorite exchanges. Uh, Pete, I need you to know we didn't abandon you. We just thought you was a toad. No, <laughs> no, they never did turn me into a toad. Well, then, that was our mistake then. <laughs> And we was beat up by a Bible salesman and banished from Woolworths. I don't know, Everett. Was it just the one Woolworths branch or all of them? <laughs> I just love that he's like telling a story like he's the these adventures. are things. Yeah. These are the things I did today. <laughs> yeah. I'm so excited about telling you. The trio stumble upon a rally of Klu Klux. Well, Klan. they're like they literally do the fight in a cartoon where like Pete and Everett are a big ball of smoke mm-hmm. <laughs> that falls down a hill, yeah. and at the bottom of the hill, the smoke dissipates, and they're like. What's that? Oh, shit. It's the KKK, yeah. motherfuckers. And uh, in this clan rally, they're planning on hanging Tommy, uh, the guitar player from before. The trio disguise themselves as Klansmen. I do is, like, to their credit, they immediately are. We got to save them. We got to save them, In yeah. the face of 100 Klansmen, who I got to compare it to, like, Be Prepared in The mm-hmm. Lion King. Mm-hmm. I love that the Klansmen are treated as evil, but in in the same way that I don't want to glorify like a mass shooter, I don't think this movie gives the Klansmen any dignity or depicts them as even fearsome or terrifying or no. organized. 
laughable. They, they do like a goddamn do si do <laughs> dance, like a hay bale dance in the beginning that's straight out of The Wizard of Oz. It's ridiculous. And they have said that was inspired by the dancing guards in front of the castle in The Wizard of Oz. But I just love... No, the, the chant is it's... Yeah, the chant is oh, the witch soldiers. Yeah. yeah. But I love that they make the KKK do the stupidest fucking dance you ever right, saw right. before they get down to like lynching an innocent man. Um, but yeah, you were saying, so they, they do the cartoon thing where they disguise themselves as the KKK, which is another Odyssey right. reference because they disguise themselves as sheep to escape the right. Cyclops. And then inexplicably, Big Dan... Well, not inexplicably that Big Dan is a clan member, but inexplicably he reveals their identities. Well, that's what happens in the Homer's Odyssey. Like it smells, it's like kind of like the fee-fi-fa-fum. It's like smells human. So I guess because he's met them before, now he remembers their smells. He knows the smell. So he reveals their identities. uh, And then chaos ensues. And the Grand Riz- Wizard himself, who's running the uh, rips climb, his own mask off, uh, re- is revealed as Homer Stokes. Um, and the trio rush Tommy away, cut the sports of a large burning cross, leaving it to fall on Big Dan, presumably killing him. There's a mild fake out. They throw a Confederate flag as a spear, like right. the flagpole is a spear. It doesn't. Which, if yeah. you know the Odyssey, a thrown wooden spear is. <clears throat> how they get the Cyclops. Right. So you assume, oh, you're in for it now, John Goodman. He stops it, and you're like, oh, he's going to live. No, a burning cross crushes right. his skull. So yeah. The Bible way. salesman is killed by a large wooden cross. Yeah. Much like in Red Dead Redemption 2, killing the KKK is always a delight, and you suffer no consequences, and you move on with your life, frankly. Mm-hmm. But now with the added information in your back pocket that Homer Stokes running for governor is a grand wizard Mm -hmm. of the Ku Klux Klan, which as Abe uh, referenced way early on, you're like, okay, well now I don't like him, even if you liked him (laughs) better than Pappy O'Daniel. It's pretty clear now. Right. Um, So we're we're closing in on the (laughs) finale. There's a big town hall meeting. An election gala. An election gala. At this point, Pappy O'Daniel is on the verge of giving up. Like he's probably going to lose the election, right? Right. Which in movie logic now you know. Well, how's he going to miraculously win the election? Well, that's because <laughs> he starts to take up uh, dirty tactics, which is that we learn that Waldrip uh, is Stokes's. Stokes's campaign manager. So he's tra- his first action is to try to steal him away, realizing that his own advisors are pieces of shit, worthless. Yeah. So he's trying to steal him, of which, of course, Waldrip says no to. Which is funny, like, Waldrip is a good, well... But then Stokes is a Grand Wizard of the KKK. We don't know if he knows We don't know if not. he knows that. Yeah. Well, we kind of, I guess, because all he does is like when he starts saying like later, when he starts saying like, I'm a part of an organization. We uh-huh. all know which I'm talking about. Waldrip is like, no, cut the brakes on that. So you, you're either. But he did know about I it. I think he did know about it. Yeah. So he's a piece of shit too. Fuck yeah. him. Yeah. So, he's a suitor. Meanwhile, because he knows Penny's going to be there, uh, George Clooney is given a big. This, which is funny, a big, like, essentially inspirational speech scene, but it's Please. real short and cut off. Yeah. It's like, look, I betrayed you, and there's no treasure. Can we continue being three lovable con men anyway, and you right. help me get my life, <laughs> wife back? And somehow, Pete's like, all right. So they disguise themselves in long fuck-off beards and pretend to be the band mm. so that they can sneak in so he can hit on Penny, essentially. Try to convince Penny that he's turned to straight and narrow and is now bo- indeed bona fide. Right. Oh, he also reveals he was in jail for practicing law without a license, which is hilarious, of course, because it's a wussy crime and exactly the kind of, you're like, of course, perfect crime for yeah. him. Who's all just silver tone. And if he tells Penny... While they're playing in the jailhouse now, which is a great song, Mm -hmm. he leans over to Penny, who's in the front of the audience, reveals, hey, it's me. I promise you should get back with me. I want to see my six daughters. I'm on the straight and narrow. I know a guy who can print me up a fake dentistry license. (laughs) And she's like, we're done. Uh, They Also, that's when Vernon tries to switch sides to Pappy. What they're doing and what uh, Pappy is doing are all intercut. Yeah. Uh, They play... But that leads to them realizing that that's the Soggy Bottom Boys, so they, the band starts playing Man of Constant Sorrow, and that, of course, brings the house down since it's the new hit. And we see them said, realize... the bye-bye-bye of this generation. Them realize we're in sync. Like, they didn't know yeah. that. They know that now because and of the way the room reacts. Pappy seizes the opportunity to dance on stage with them at the end, uh, 
while Homer accuses them of messing up the Klan rally, turning the audience against him. So now this is where the constituency, as they say in the movie, uh, has now actually gone 180 from where you walked into the scene. They're now on Pappy's side because just popularity of the soggy bottom boys, I guess. Because a popular musician endorsed the candidate. Right. And you'd like to think... (laughs) Because Homer Stokes is outed as a Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan. Right. But the way it's shot and edited, you get more of the impression that it's just like, they really like this song. They really love that song. <laughs> but to he the is, point of getting, they get pardoned of he, their crimes. Because he's the incumbent governor, remember? Right. So he still has pardon abilities. So on stage, he pardons them from crimes that are vague. He doesn't know he what doesn't those know crimes, crimes are. He just double checks. He's like, you guys are on the straightened path now. Right. You know, like he double checks for one second and they go, oh, yes, sir. Yes, yes. Uh, I wrote that. This was my note word for word. <laughs> Clooney gets so excited because, oh, he also says, you guys are going to be my brain trust. So this is now a real government job that will pay well. Right. So Clooney is now bona fide in this moment. He is yeah. bona fide. And he does what I wrote as an amazing old timey chicken dance, like some fabulous Jagger of yore. He like he, d- Clooney's dance is up there with the fucking what's the mumblecore comedy about the guy who throws ham at his llama, and then the climactic thing is a dance. Napoleon Dynamite. Oh, oh I think yeah, this yeah. is up there with the Napoleon Dynamite dance. Clooney yeah. just kills. This crazy Mick Jagger chicken dance. Yeah, yeah. He like kicks, he like lifts his pants up while he kicks and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And whereas Odysseus had to fire a single arrow through a hundred axe handles lined up in a row, Mm -hmm. he had to sing Man of Constant Sorrow. A song he already sang randomly once. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah. But that's the equivalent action. As they, uh, they, so obviously the mob, <laughs> obviously the mob takes Homer. Rides him out, out on a rail. On a rail. Yeah. And then as they exit, they see a mob is also captured, Babyface, and the, it's announced that he'll be electrocuted. But he announces, or he tells everyone, he's telling the three, but he's yeah. yelling and for all to, the to hear, uh, he feels 10 feet tall. Uh, I, I also noticed that a woman in the back as they're leaving yells, cow killer. Yeah, definitely. I was like, uh. Delmer goes, what's a brain trust, Everett? And he goes, well, Delmer, we're going to be the uh, power behind the throne, so to speak. Oh, okay. No, <laughs> like, okay. He's going to now run the state. Yeah. Delmer. Oh, God. Del- oh, God. The so next morning, the Clooney group- clearly has Penny back. Yeah. They've she got an- has her six kids on leashes. Except she, they're <laughs> like, as long as you retrieve the ring. That's uh, her demand is he get their original wedding ring, which, of course... Really is where the tre- where he said the treasure was. It's in their old right, cabin. Right. It's just not a treasure. It's just a ring, know. a wedding ring. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It's her grandma's ring, right? And it's day of the flood, so to speak. Um, mm-hmm. That's the timeline for us. So it's cabin in the valley. Uh, the police have learned the place from Pete, so they're already there waiting for them to arrest them. Which they knew. It's kind of weird. That's like they forgot that they knew that Pete sold them out. <laughs> right, but also Pete forgot that you know <laughs> that like, there's george a lot of Clooney. forgetting and buddy yeah. their buddy well george clooney's now like you three tommy right. delmer and pete are going to be my wedding party yeah and we're all going to work together as the brain trust so now they're officially like the scooby-doo gang i guess yeah no it's yeah. it's definitely one of those things that like cohen brothers like for some reason in my head it, were this a different movie i would be a little less enthusiastic about it i'd be like that doesn't make any sense but because they have built spent so much time building up that almost everyone in this world is a cartoon i'm like yeah. a little bit fine with they're it they're the home team of course yeah. they're together for the final quest yeah yeah yeah, yeah. um but the cops are waiting we got a Oh, not the final musical number, but we get a real raw musical number, which is the Grave Diggers singing "You Have to Go to That Lonesome Valley." How about that by bass, yourself? That bass, uh, yeah, sound. punctuated by a dude just just hitting the lowest, just tone singing ever. the brown note yeah. like the, <laughs> oh, yeah, the I low shit tone. Myself. Yeah. I literally oh. shit myself. Uh, but a even human though they've been deal. pardoned, uh, Sheriff Cooley has. It's just like, well, I haven't heard that because he's because he's on the, the devil, and the devil don't care about man's justice. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I also think this is the moment where he he explicitly underscores, no, I am the magical devil from the Bible, right? Because he says, I don't respect man's law, and yeah. you're like, oh, so even he knows he's so not a man. No matter what they do, 
they're fucked. Uh, we was pardoned. It went out on the radio. Right. We ain't got no radio. <laughs> right. It's just this kind of like Brazil, you know, kind of like... Uh, I want your souls. Yeah. No. Um, but then just as... So now they know they're confronted with their yeah. death. Then the, they might Everett be... Ge- does something interesting. <laughs> oh, what? He oh, yeah, decides right. to pray to God. Yeah. Which he's not a God loving man he's unaffiliated uh so he's one of the same he's you know definitely uh like what do they call him foxhole atheist or whatever right um and he says oh lord please look down and recognize our poor sinners he's he's asking forgiveness to god and about how helpless they are and for the sake of my family for tommy's sake for delmar for pete's and this is all happening while in slow mo in slow motion we're kind of seeing that the something's happening somewhere else and what that something is is the dam is breaking uh it just takes a little while for it to get uh get around to them so the valley's flooded and they're quote unquote saved tommy finds a ring in the desk that floats by which is just deus ex you know well i think one of the most important shots is that the flood shot the only, rather than doing a massive That's, special effect the way they did the flood shot is just this one long slow mo, completely underwater shot. Yeah, you see a dog of debris you floating dog. by while the song "Lonesome Valley" continues, oh, even yeah, though the grave diggers are presumably floating. Yeah. Um, and each thing that goes by really is like a look back through the movie. <laughs> Remember that? Well, it's, this um, happened. There's it's dapper revert- damn cans. It's reverse. It's very cool looking shot, yeah, but I mean, all it, to me, it really does is it. It's really just doing the uh, Wizard of Oz, which does it at the beginning. Yes, uh, but it's like everything's in a whirlwind. The twister is tornado taking vortex. Them back yeah. to yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> and then, see dapper Dan cans, and they are indeed saved as Tyrese has said they would be. He sees a cow in a cotton house. They're floating on a coffin. So just, you know, I guess that yeah. symbol is a just escaping a by the A Civil War teeth. photo. Um, I can't remember whose. A tire on a rope, which I think is just like an American right. symbol. And Tommy finds the roll-top desk with a ring in it by sheer chance, which makes you feel as if his prayer worked. Right. And, of course, they rag him for that. They're like, you prayed and it worked. Like... And he's like, I don't believe in God. And they're like, it (laughs) seems like you believe in God. It's just science. The river got damned up. He's like, but it seemed like you believe in God like a minute ago, you know? And he goes, well, what's your favorite line? You give this one. Abers. Which one? Oh, oh, maybe it's not your favorite line, but I always thought your favorite line in the movie was, well, Pete, any human being will cast about in a moment of stress (laughs) explaining why he can believe in God. (laughs) Um, <laughs> so he, the denouement, I'm going to rocket us out of this. Sure. Spectra. We're already an hour 20 in. Punchline ending. Clooney goes back to Penny. Everything seems fine. The world, all is right with the world. But Penny reveals that the ring they got's the wrong ring. Now he has to get the right ring. And she demands that he does. And that ring now is, is at the bottom of the flooded right. valley. So it's like a new quest. Here we go again. I've counted to three, honey. Tiresias uh, appears on the railroad track. One of the Warvi girls waves at him. End of movie. <laughs> I love how the children are chained together. Kind yeah, of like they're on leashes yeah, of twine. Because, so they don't wander and get lost, but it's like the beginning of the movie. You know, like, oh, yeah, he has his own little chain gang it now. Ends with, yeah, she, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I also, one of my favorite things I never caught till this time is, that's uh, the final Odyssey reference in the movie is, honey, one ring in the middle of all that water, that's one heroic task, which is one of the famous tasks in Greek mythology, not the Odyssey specifically, but is a dude going to the bottom of some body of water and recovering a ring. So even that is a reference to just the world of... Okay, which I think we should get into as we move into pedagogy. Is how is it like the Odyssey? That can start us off... Well, I thought it could start us off uh, with pedagogy. I have lots of different questions as far as the themes and the meaning, but let's start with a light one and bring up the fact that it's fascinating that they claim, and I can see it to be true. I, like, I don't find a reason to disbelieve it. The Coens claim that they've never read the Odyssey or hadn't before writing this film anyway. Only get, g- gathered things from pop culture. Is what pop culture argue. osmosis. Yeah. And that really struck a chord with me because it cracked. We would be responsible for such a wide variety of things to make fun of. And you gain this ability to know, like, 
uh, for example, there were c- people in the room who had never read Harry Potter, but if you said we needed a Harry Potter joke, they know Slytherin's the evil one, mm-hmm. Ron Weasley, red-haired, large family, yeah. Quidditch broom sport. Like, you know four things that you could make a joke if you had to. Right. And it seems like they did that with the Odyssey. They sat in a room where we're like, don't look it up. What do you remember from the Odyssey, mm-hmm. from hearing about it throughout our lives? Yeah, that, there's some, there's a few sneaky ones that I'm like, I don't believe it entirely just because it's such a like random, abst- not abstract, but like very specific. Like, for example, I think there needs to be something like the characters disguise themselves as the KKK leaders when they free Tommy, right? Yeah, which is the sheep and the Cyclops story. Right, the sheep hiding. That's... Them hiding under the sheep to, like, escape Polyphemus, I think is his name. Yeah. Uh, that's not, like, a super well-known. Uh, I would say it's more just the Cyclops myth, not that they got away with that. Or even the spear, like, the fact that he throws the flaming spear, which blinds the Cyclops. Yeah. Uh, those are two very distinctive, like, aspects of the Cyclops myth. It's true. And I, don't I don't know. I've read maybe the Odyssey, they knew, so it's maybe hard for me to know. Yeah. But, but it, like, I feel like you would remember the Cyclops, the Lotus Eaters, the Sirens. I mean, they're smart sh- dudes. Like, I know, like, tribus. maybe your average person who hasn't read the Odyssey would only remember Cyclops and mm-hmm. Sirens. But I couldn't, I don't put it past Joel and Ethan that they've heard of the Lotus Eaters and they remember it. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Anyway, uh, but it's interesting to me because it highlights that spiritually, this is a lot like Buster Scruggs in the sense that. They wanted to do an anthology romp Mm -hmm. about American mythology. Right, yeah. So that's why Robert Jordan's famous myth is also thrown in. That's why... Tall tales. Other tall tales are thrown in. And I just think that really is the key to unlocking. Like, if you watch this movie that way, it reveals so much of itself. Uh, There's a few other ones I wanted to point out that the internet helped uh, doing research on the internet. Uh, When... You know how they wear beards to sneak into the political rally so uh-huh. Everett can talk to Penny? Uh, in the Odyssey, Odysseus is di- uh, disguised by Athena so he may talk to Penelope uh, at, his, at his own house without the suitors knowing. Right, right, right. He, so it's okay. like literally a beard. You know? So the uh, big campaign gala is mimicking the like meat hall with the all the suitors home. in it yeah. when Odysseus was yeah. back. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Obviously, we talked about the sirens, and we talked about Big Dan T. Uh, but the, Babyface Nelson also <clears throat> is not from the Odyssey. It's from real American right, folklore. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, something that's interesting is the uh, Harvey, like with the whole, like, you are not our daddy, you were hit by a train. Yeah. Uh, so the three Harvey girls don't recognize their dad, really, uh, even if they do. Uh, and they they just don't believe him. Right. Uh, Telemachus, which is Odysseus. Telemachus. Telemachus uh, but it's just because he's been gone son, for 25 years. Doesn't recognize Odyssey, his own father. Yeah. yeah. That's also like... Maybe it is Telemachus. Thinks he was a god. <laughs> um, but yeah. So there's a lot of... Oh, and I wanted to mention Papio Daniel, also based on a real famous corrupt politician Menelius. who... Oh, yeah. No, the actual... Yeah, so like, the ones that I American. noticed that are a blending of real American folklore where Babyface Nelson is based, is an analog for a real dude. Uh, Robert Johnson was an analog for Tommy Johnson mm-hmm. and Pappy O'Daniel. There was really like, I, like a Pappy something flower hour radio show. That was a real thing. And he was modeled after him. There might be more if you know, cause American folklore is less like, you know, I can't even roll the it as easily as the mm-hmm. Odyssey. But I also think. So the the movie breaks down, yeah, into this idea of weaving the Odyssey with American folklore, but also it's a low-key musical. And I just want to bring special interest to, I guess sound editing should be how do you do that, huh? Okay, but but we got to at least talk about the music. Why oh, do you yeah, think, definitely. Why do you think the soundtrack is so key, and why do you think such a high percentage of this is musical? Well, I, yeah, I think there's something to be... Uh, said about just the fact that there's a um, a radio station that takes place. Like like you mentioned, the Pappy O'Daniel is based on a real figure uh, who had a radio show called The Flower Hour. Um, and he used a backing band called The Light Crust Doughboys. <laughs> so everything was like flower themed. Yeah. Uh, and he, and actually 
O'Daniel carried a broom in cam- as a campaign device for the reform era, promise- promising to sweep away uh, corruption. And uh, his theme song had a hook, pre- please pass the biscuits, Pappy, mm. meaning he's Pappy and he's like yeah. giving you all your bread. Um, which, but that's great. But only but when he you was, call him daddy. There, he was well known though, because at yeah. this time he was also a he was a politician who yeah. was well known for using radio yeah. as his main device. Yeah, as like a campaign device. Whereas yeah, others, that's exactly didn't. what it is in the movie. They didn't change. They anything. didn't change yeah, it. Yeah. yeah, it's not even yeah. a tall tale. Um, the KKK stuff. I don't know if Pepe O'Daniels, Homer Stokes was. I don't think there's Homer no Homer Stokes, Stokes based but on anyone. If he had a like, if the KKK was involved in. Well, the KKK because it's Mississippi are, in the 30s are mythical villains of that time. Yeah, into some I'm just regard. wondering about what's true and what's. I really up. doubt. I can't think of a Homer Stokes analog in real American history, but I'm sure there were politicians who were members of the Ku Klux Klan in the South. Yeah, um, but they already split the pappy into two. But you diverted from the soundtrack question immediately. Oh. Well, um, I, if you want to go to Howdy Do That, let's do that. No, no, no. That's not Howdy Do That. I want to ask philosophically. You're writing, an, uh, I mean, I have my own answer, but I was trying to give you some love. The, uh, you're making an adaptation of the Odyssey. Why say it's got to have 12 songs and we got to get T-Bone Burnett for this? I think <laughs> yeah. it's because they're showcasing also the only other authentic form of um, white American music, yeah. be- which is like blues and I mean it's not white but my point is I guess what I'm getting at is Tommy is thrown in but that's really not enough Mm. Um, and I don't think they felt comfortable showcasing the real authentic (laughs) form of American music which is rhythm and blues that grew into rock that grew into hip hop and everything but like one of the only actual forms of authentic American sound art is like this bluegrass hayseed country music. So I think they felt compelled to include it because this is almost a placemat tour of Americana. Yeah. And so the songs, which have no connection, like the Odyssey is not musical. And I guess it rhymes. The whole thing rhymes. So maybe I'm spitballing here now, but maybe they felt since it was based on an epic poem, it had to be musical as well. Yeah, I think it's it's more of um I mean, I think that there's a lot there's a lot there. I, I especially like your point about the Americana. Uh it almost reads like they sold this uh like soundtrack and it did really well. Mm-hmm. I mean, not just because the songs are good, but it like really feels like the album is like a a cut into 1930s to 50s bandstand. You know, it's like all the the tracks that made America America yeah. at the turn of the century into the, for the next hundred years. And so there's something about the musical nature of this time, uh, especially as broadcast becomes a thing, they needed to fill the airwaves and music was the answer to that. So, yeah. the, so it was this kind of, it's not just mass communicating, it was mass culturally, culturally. Totally. And, and uh, yeah. that's, and I think that like uh, Tommy plays a role in that. It's not like, it's definitely a, a wider movie could be in a Coen brothers movie, but it's also kind of, there's bluegrass, there's, you know, you are my sunshine. There's like, even though they all feel old and archaic to us now, it's definitely true that there's multiple types of musics that are, uh, represented in just this movie. I just think they're obsessed with American folk music. Yeah. Much like David Byrne, uh, which is why they'll eventually make a movie about Bob Dylan analog. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> Uh, and I also think that might be the reason there's three blind characters it is maybe a nod to this movie's about sound. And they often mention, well, close your eyes or, oh, the blind are in tune with different things. Uh, I think pedagogically there's a like an ode to sound in the heart of this movie. Yeah. And yeah, how important true. sound is. The... The soundscape at the beginning when it's cicadas and then the chain gang, and that's actually a real recording of a real chain gang that they use as the sound effect uh, yeah. and the cha- and the song. I don't know. I want to ask them in person, why is sound so so <clears throat> core to American history to you, or why why did you think this was the movie to showcase music? 
But maybe they're just like peanut butter and chocolate. These things go together well. I think well. so. I think because also we talked about Big Lebowski. Why is there a cowboy in it? Sometimes they just go for it. Yeah, sometimes they. Just, uh, I did want to point out that T Bone uh, Burnett, mm -hmm. when getting the Chang Gang, which is an older recording for the sounds in the films, uh, tracked down, which I think is nice, considering that we uh, he tracked down one of the people who were on the Chang Gang that was still alive and gave uh -huh. him money. Wow. Uh, for the rights. Yeah. Uh, even though they That's had great. no rights to it just because they're technically performing in it. And right. If, if, you, if you, once you use it as art, it's now art. You yeah. Know? Like, uh, totally. T which is it's crazy. It's also cool that T-Bone's like a music detective. Like he finds recordings that right. have not been heard in 80 years. But when you look at it from earlier in this podcast's run, uh, like how they were like smacked with Barton Fink, uh, the mosquito in American Humane. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought that, that was kind of interesting in terms of sometimes they're really good at looking ahead of like what's, what's going yeah. on with the logistics of the movie and other times they're not. They're clearly getting better at also, it. Also, American Humane got upset about the CG cow because they didn't believe them it was CG. Yeah, until... That's funny to me because to my modern eyes, I'm like, it's CG. Right. We it, looks like Harry <laughs> it looks like Harry Potter on top of the troll in Harry Potter right. 1. Uh, they, they had to meet up at Digital Domain, which is like a space, uh, like a neutral space and between American they could make a cow. Uh, to, to show how the cows cr were created. <laughs> and then finally, the American Humane Association was like, oh, it also changed... Um, they also added this example. Uh, there's a few firsts for this movie, but one of the first was the Humane Association added, uh, it's more familiar now, but then it was more rare. Uh, scenes may, which may appear to place an animal in jeopardy were simulated. That was something that didn't exist. Oh, I've never seen that before. Is that on credits? A That's lot often in credits. Uh, you know, like or no animals were hurt during the making of this film was the only one that they really had as a motto. I think, I think it was a freakazoid that ended with, correct me if I'm wrong, internet, no animals were harmed in the making of this cartoon. Okay, someone was mean to my cat and someone shot a duck, but that's it. <laughs> but that's it, someone <laughs> shot a duck. Uh, but yeah, uh, that's, mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know. I, I don't really have an answer, but going back to the musical question about it. You sure. know, like I, I think it is peanut butter and jelly a little bit. I th I think it's because it's the only, one of the only authentic forms of American expression that originated in the like continental U.S. Uh, what do you think? Well, it's probably is. I think all of their happy films, uh -huh. and by happy films, what I mean to say are ones that are kind of like usually have some fools involved and the fools aren't made fun of but are usually like end up okay so comedies I'm i guess I'm glad you said cuz they they are musical they like are, Big Lebowski is musical also they are shakespearean like i feel like yeah. they're one of the few filmmakers you could line their movies up and sort them into the comedies and the tragedies yeah you really can yeah <laughs> even know. though they're always got like black comedy in their tragedies and mm. there's usually things that you wouldn't expect to be like heart yeah. that you wouldn't expect to see in a comedy uh, so they kind of feel like they're this weird dramedy, you know, mm -hmm. space, but they really are. You can clearly delineate what, what's what, in my opinion, yeah. in terms of what happens to the characters. Like, is, does it end in a wedding or a funeral kind of stuff? Every musical movie of theirs is a comedy that I can think of except for Lou and Davis. <laughs> um, so I think there, they're following, you know, the, the general tenant, the comedy is, or the music is a joyous thing you're more likely to use it when you're going to be having a fun time. But it's, then it's interesting that Lewin Davis can say, what if we put together all the most depressing songs mm -hmm. and made that a movie? Uh, there's, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm, there's two, uh, two other references in this movie that I wanted to point out. Okay. Uh, one of them is the one that we kind of talked about a little bit, which is The Sheriff Devil. Is, uh, if, it look, if you recognize how he looks... It's not the first time that this look has been put on a sheriff. Uh, it's supposed to be based on Cool Hand Luke's boss, Godfrey, who also represents death and the devil in that movie. By, uh, and mainly it's the reflective glasses. It's also, you know, the I think that I realize dog now I think that counts, too. They probably the think of him. They probably think of Cool Hand Luke as an mm -hmm. American myth, too. Yeah. Like he's probably in the same camp as Babyface Nelson and Papio exactly, Daniel. Exactly, exactly. Uh, and 
uh, when we hear Tommy's line, he's white, white as you folks, with empty eyes, a big hollow voice, he likes to travel around with a mean old hound. I think that's like the American devil now. Right. You know, like, yeah. That's... And the state. Yeah, the oppressive state is the American right. devil, certainly for a black man in the South at this right. time. Um, what do you think is the answer as simple as sepia tone is nostalgic and this took place in a nostalgic time. What do you think is the philosophical decision-making process behind the unbelievable, unprecedented, innovative use of digital color correction in this film? Uh, Which, of course, will unpack more in how do you do that. But since it's pedagogy, I'm asking about the artistic choice, you know? Uh, I mean, I actually have... Uh, what they say? What Deacon said in a cinematographer mm. magazine... Um, he's willing to be more forward than them. Sometimes. He's willing to be. That's yeah. something we notice with him too. He talks about the process a lot because that's what he's doing, but it's very, um, Ethan and Joel wanted a dry, dusty Delta look with golden sunsets mm -hmm. and they were shooting in this very green area. So, and it was very lush cause it was Mississippi in the summer. Mm -hmm. So I think, we, I think the dust bowl look, it just made sense for the color schemes that they wanted to set up to be, uh, you know, super muted and super uh, desaturated. So it might be as practical as turn that green field yellow. Okay, now the sky looks weird. Yeah. Let's desaturate everything. Uh, <laughs> and I think, it, yeah, and it, a lot of people don't give a lot of credit to the fact of otherwise, you know, of course there's black and white films and there's color films of different Manual film colorization, uh, but drawing on the This frames. film really did start a, because it was 2000, it really did start this, like, this feeling in movies where like there was a tonal kind of like if you ever watch now all the movies like the dark night and stuff like that where all the the tones feel like even your blacks yeah. are blues and your your whites it are looks blue. totally different but before this really is one of the cohen's true like first yeah. i think before this movie people didn't do choices like they didn't say let's make batman always be muted blue right. so even though it's not they didn't do muted blue they did this interesting yellow bleach bypass right uh this was the first movie where you're like oh color correction can be part of the creative choice and i think we may have gone too far with that as a culture. Mm -hmm. Like it might be more harmful than good now, but it certainly works for oh brother. I Ooh. mean, you can do this on your phone right now. If you pull out your phone and you pull up Instagram mm -hmm. and you start playing with the Instagram filters and just try to pay attention to the dark, like take a photo and look at the darkest point. You'll notice that as you scan around, what is quote unquote black is not the same throughout. Right? right. And that's the kind of thing that Deacons and the colorists were doing in this film is to make it feel kind of, I think to make it feel otherworldly, to make it feel like it comes from a picture book because you see this kind of thing happen more in less in photography and more in like drawings. And I think that's totally true with the way the shots are set up. So like, for example, you talk about the long shot where the, truck playing Homer Stokes' theme song passes a yeah. random farmer in a field. The field is made to look like a comically endless field of an endless number of plants that are identical to one another. Right. Like a blinding grid of blank space. Beyond that, and there's many shots where you're like, it's just flat dirt as far as the eye can see to an unbelievable degree. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Mississippi people who live in Mississippi. Yeah. But uh, I do think they are trying to make it otherworldly. Even the landscape is exaggerated. You're like, okay, I know the landscape is boring in Mississippi, but they found the most boring shot of it possible. They're exaggerating it. And they knew that they were going to be shooting in summer in Mississippi, which is crazy because that also means that they knew what tough shoot. They knew what, <laughs> uh, yeah, really humid. They, I mean, that's why everyone's sweating in this movie all the time. Uh, but they also knew what kind of greenery was going to be around, and it's a right. very bright green. So they knew, like, so a lot of the costume designer, like Mary Zeofres, and like the production designers. Um, they had to make sure that no green was involved because they knew that then they the were going to go would back. Then the color too much. Because yeah, they, uh, they just had to destroy the green mm, like to make right. it even barely green. So if they put a Washington apple in the movie... It was going to look like gray. Although now you could power window it, but the technology at the time was just beginning to... I mean, yeah, yeah you could. You still could. You still could. But 
they're a crack team and they support each other throughout the work right. through pl- process. And that's, what's important. But that, that, I think that that's, this is all in part of like trying to find something that didn't look like Ireland because they right. didn't want something lush. They wanted something dust bully, dust bully yeah. and old. And it, I think that's kind of speaks also to the Odyssey itself because it's like, even that story feels like before classical, yeah. you know, it's like one of the oldest tales we have. And there's American tall tales all in this, so it's all very the old. Color, the color dark. correction for Three Kings reminds me of this color correction in a good way, but I bet most people disagree with me. <laughs> I would disagree. I know. But uh, that's fine. <laughs> what do you think about the final beat being... I, I think I know the answer, but... He prays and it comes true, so in this universe, God is explicitly real. We're seeing a lot more than we thought we'd see when we started off this podcast, right? Yes. Have you noticed that? But I'm developing a sneaking suspicion that the Coen brothers are kind of even smugger atheists than I thought. Oh, really? Because I'm starting to realize, oh, there's more movies than I thought it's all with true. angels in heaven. Right. But then I realize, which ones are they? Hudsucker Proxy, which is in a Frank Capra universe. Oh, brother, which is in a universe of tall tales. And they're all dummies. And all Buster of, Scruggs, yeah. which is uh, like a Tex Avery cartoon, even further than a Chuck Jones cartoon. Mm. I think they have a running joke in their work that God is only real in universes that are ridiculous and stupid. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. Like, like if like God exists in the movie... It's a clue that we're in a cartoon. A cartoon that doesn't make sense to anyone. (laughs) Which is mean to say, but I do think that's their stance. I mean, yeah, (laughs) there's a few others. I I think that there's, yeah, yeah. Well, I can keep accruing info as we go. The next one, their 2001 entry. Well, Jesus. But that's, that's an interesting one to talk about. That's why that's, we'll talk that's about it. We'll talk about it on not this episode. Uh, but yeah, that's in, uh, I mean, I, I kind of have the same sneaky suspicion uh, just because those movies that you mentioned and in this one in particular, uh, the Coen brothers, like we mentioned with the Busker Scruggs one, I like to argue about how they, they, they don't like poetic justice. They don't like this concept of if you do good things, you're going to get good back from the world. They're like, if you do good, you do bad, things are going to happen, if good or bad. Except maybe 8% of the time, they do. They, they let do. It, they slip one yeah. in. And they're yeah. usually the ones where something like this happens, where you have Everett pray to God and ask for forgiveness and apologize for his sins. And then or he, Norval commits suicide, but an angel saves him. And yeah. then you could read it as happenstance, given you know the totality of Coen Brothers cinema, but you yeah. get the sneaky kind of suspicion that even though he's not the greatest guy, he is kind of baptizing himself in this moment, and then he gets baptized by the river, of course. Mm. Um, so it's there is this feeling of providence. And, uh, of course, he doesn't acknowledge it even when it happens to him. He's like, it's just science. Someone dammed up that river. Uh, Although Norval is even harder to... He jumped off a building, and then he's so like, that's magic. That's literal magic. Because he then yeah. gets up and walks away. Right, with, yeah. right. But, uh, but in those movies, they're all, uh, they're all fools, too. Uh, they, they might be good fools in terms of like... Is Everett a fool? Yeah. He's like a I would argue braggadocious fool. fool, but do you think he's actually dumb? Um, I think... Uh, or is he more, I always thought it was just a rascal. <laughs> I think of them all as kind of different shades of dumb, different types of dumb. He's I not mean, as smart as he thinks he is. He's definitely. not as smart as he thinks he is, and his he considers himself a tactician, but he doesn't have plans. Mm, uh, he true. gets super attached to random things like the superficiality of his hair gel. Um, mm. Like he has things... You're he right, has he's, that, a, he's a dumb. He has that Buster <laughs> Scruggs uh, number five problem, which is that he has things that he's very certain about, and mm-hmm. he just had this is certain. This is what it is. Girl who got rattled. Yeah, the girl who got five. rattled. Uh, <laughs> and then the second that it doesn't prove itself to him, he gets angry. <laughs> yeah. uh, and then if it's proved back, like if he, he's, he remains alive, he just says, ah, it must have been something else. So he he's dumb in that way. Obviously, Delmar is like simple, and Pete is a little less simple. But uh, I see them all as fools. 
Well, I have a la- a p- only one pedagogy question left. What's your s- pedagogy situation? Uh, the only one that I wanted to talk about is how much, and they talked about how the title of the film, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou?, is a reference to the 1941 film by Preston Sturges called Sullivan's Travels, which, by the way, everyone should go out and see if you can get a copy of it. Uh, it's a great movie where the protagonist uh, is a director, uh, and he's like an A-list director of like the 50s, and uh, he everyone's he's like yeah he's a list he's Everyone, bored of succeeding he's bored of succeeding usually makes comedies and musicals and um he decides that in his next picture he's going to do something that confronts the problems of the average man and one of the name of the movie that he's trying to make he's he's decidedly called a brother where art thou uh the director goes on a journey of human suffering and the uh he goes into Tennessee, I believe is where he's from and just kind of like hitchhikes and it's a road movie kind of thing. Uh, and he just wants to take stock of the average man. He's felt he's gotten out of touch with it. Um, and a bunch of other things happen to him, just like in this film, like it's just different chapters of crazy little things that happen. Uh, and it also has got a real cool beat at the end of the film. I won't spoil it for you. That involves prisoners at a picture show. Mm -hmm. Um, so there's a lot of nods to that, but I think that this is also, there's some, there's a bigger question. It's more of a question, less of an answer that I have is, um, that was Sturges reflecting, I think on his life in kind of a half cock way. Like he kind of was, he was like saying like, ah, I'm Preston Sturges. I made a lot of crazy movies, uh, that were like no one else would have made. And I got, I mean, he was an A-list director at the time. He was like a Capra. Mm-hmm. Um, and the Coen brothers knew that they were already success, success too. They had gotten an Academy Award. And I wonder if this is their Sullivan's Travels kind of thing. Like, is that... But do you mean genuinely? Hit- like, you think they're yeah. saying we're bored of our I, success? I, uh, I don't think so this time. I don't think that. I think that the reason that Sturges did it, and if they know, know this or they think this as well... Uh, they're kind of poking fun at themselves. That, like, look how big we are, right? We're not really that big, but it's funny to think of us as like big. But Oh Brother doesn't but, strike me as pretentious. Like it's not Oscar bait or anything. I think that's it's a fun romp. I think that's what they're autocorrecting too. Is that this movie is like, it's kind of like a self fulfilling prophecy. Like we're not pretentious, so we're gonna make an everyman thing, right? And then. And then what else are you going to do? With we it? Are, well, we're going to base it on the Odyssey. And right. what, what else are you going to do? Well, we're we're going to title it the Preston Sturges movie. Yeah, yeah. You know? I think they are... Uh, I also think that lays bare one of their core strategies that makes... So they make movies sometimes like mixing an ice cream flavor, like a Ben and Jerry's one that has a chocolate core and a nougat ribbon mm-hmm. <laughs> and chocolate chunks. Because they'll... It's the same as Lebowski. It's like an adaptation of a Dashiell Hammett novel, but blended with 90s LA and bookended with cowboy tropes. This is the Odyssey, but clearly also they were thinking of Sullivan's Travels when they structured it. And they were like, let's throw in John Dillinger and, you know, like random American folk tales. And what if it had musical numbers? And yet it all feels so consistent. So like a good Ben and Jerry's pint, like I didn't know this before we did this podcast, but deep analysis has revealed to me one of their best tricks is merge four genres and then make it consistent. Like you're not actively thinking about this is a bunch of crazy. Right. It's almost like a Beck song. It's like not, what genre is this? No, it's not yeah. a problem that structure or formality can beat. It's just But taste. man, they never very rarely adapt one thing at a time. No. Like, this is an adaptation of four different movie ideas blended together seamlessly. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering about, I want to talk about the actual theme, um, because I think it's the hardest (laughs) thing to come to terms with in all of life, and everyone eventually has to, and it's destroying me, which is you'll not get the treasure you seek. Mm -hmm. Uh, Even people who achieve their childhood dreams, when you get to the real experience, of course, there's a classic syndrome of, it's good. It feels different. It's not like everything is now shining light, right? It's not what I imagine. But I don't even mean that. I mean the vast majority of people will not end up doing whatever they thought they were going to do when they were a kid. Doesn't that make you just want to kill yourself, Abe? <laughs> uh, How do you give up on that and like the treasure that you get? 
That is a very common theme in there. Or is the answer to pray to God and then he'll bring you the ring and everything. Yeah, let's go down to the river. <laughs> no, to pray. he doesn't get it though, because no, even he he's like he wants his happy family life. Yeah, and it ends with, no, that's the wrong ring. You gotta go out again. Life keeps coming at you with obstacles. Obstacles. Uh well I here here's the thing with that. I mean the whole reason, the, I have a real no. answer and I have like a podcast answer. I want the real answer because I'm saying we made this podcast network to find the treasure we seek, but this is not the treasure that we seek. <laughs> it's not what we started out seeking. Yeah, uh, I think that uh, paths are made. All right, if you want my real answer, I don't think that you should be looking for answers in literature and films and fiction. Mm. I think oh, that fiction. I, I think that fiction is a wonderful story to uh, pass the time that makes us reflect on the re- the reality of things. Mm. But they're uh, created by these false gods, which are humans Whoever or Cohen brothers. In these days. Yeah. So I don't think I. Yeah, it's true. Life is that way, uh, and you don't get what you want by some combination of luck and or not working hard enough or, or not having, having a, more hearts, so not God having the right face right. or race or gender. You know, like there's there's so many things that get into the making of things. That I uh, I think that you just do you. I mean, that's like a soundbite wisdom that makes no sense, but you just... You think you're going to get the treasure you see. I, you're still in the denial phase. I'm still, I'm still <laughs> drinking the Kool-Aid. Yeah, maybe, maybe. Uh, I also just think that, like, you'll be... The treasure you seek is just, like, to me, happiness. Like, just being happy and... No, like, it's signing a <laughs> contract for a film deal. <laughs> But that's what I'm asking. That's what I mean is that in this context. Yeah, in this context. That's the hardest aspect in my life is not getting that treasure. I have other treasures. Yeah, well, I think that there's always. <laughs> my cat is a treasure. <laughs> Your cat is but a treasure. But the treasure I seek, everyone out there listening to this probably already knows, is a Hollywood film deal. <laughs> yeah, no, I agree with that. And that would, that would help with my happiness. But that yeah. to me is also like that's, a, that's criteria of my value. Happiness being my value, the criterion. criterion being, being the criterion collection, that's my value. <laughs> that's, uh, well, if you want to get that, yeah. I hope you do. I hope you all get the treasure that you the, seek. The treasure. Or learn how to enjoy do not, no, hold on. the treasure you seek. Do not seek the well, that's treasure. What, yeah, do not, you won't get the treasure you seek. And it also burns coming from Joel and Ethan Cohen, who, of the people on the earth, I'm sure have struggles, but are probably so close oh, to yeah. the treasure. Closer than most people get to what they yeah. imagined they wanted to do with their lives. It's like, um, They're doing what they want to do with like their lives. It's like that interview with, um, <laughs> it's like that interview with, there was like a Taylor Swift interview with a few years ago mm. where she was just like, That's, so fast. you just got to keep going. You just got to keep going and you'll, you'll make it. And, and like, it's like, you blew no, up when you're 14 years old. Yeah. Like, <laughs> you don't you, know that. You don't know that because <laughs> yeah. you didn't do that. You got extremely lucky. You won the lottery. Immediately. Uh, fast. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so what the fuck are you talking about? Yeah. And it's just true. Like some people have it easy. It's like, you're right. You've gleaned that insight. Oh, and that's the other thing I wanted to take issue with is I know you didn't mean it that way, but to be clear, I do think stories often can lead you to insights you didn't have Absolutely. before I know, that I are know. true. I know. I was just But I know facetious. what you mean by like the story beats bear, don't bear on reality. So I'm, like Tay Swift is right that that's true wisdom. Mm-hmm. But she gleaned that from hearing that other people say that until she knows that that's a truism of life. Mm-hmm. But she didn't learn that from her own lived experience. Yeah. Well, you, you don't know, Tay Tay. You the know modern did, Theresius. <laughs> Charles Durning, Papio Daniel himself, did not get a part until he was 41. Uh, so, like, I admire actors like that who did. He was a dance teacher. He was a dance instructor right. until he got his first film role at 41. So and he, Tim can Blake say, Nel- he Tim- can say, stick to your plan, you know? Tim Blake Nelson also was a uh, classic literature like professor. And is you spends most and wasn't of wasn't in this movie until some, like he was their neighbor. Or something. Spends most of his time directing films. He knew them because he is a director and they're directors. And I believe his wife, uh, they had dinner with his wife, and he came along as the husband, and they hit it off. And then later they're like, "Do you want to be in <laughs> Oh Brother Where Art Thou?" I think they were just like read the script and tell us what you think. Yeah. And he thought, and he said, "I don't have to read the script." 
Right. Yeah. N- yeah. But I right? think it's. I think well, that's I, the I think story. The, the story was that he didn't know that he he thought he was auditioning for a role, and they thought they were just Giving having him, him a look at the script. <gasps> oh, okay. And he was hope, and so he auditioned. I don't know what the truth is. Yeah, yeah but, but I I know he and. He's definitely appreciative of what an opportunity it was. Oh, man, and he's perfect. He's yeah, perfect. yeah, but he told, yeah, he said to Clooney, like, the script, Coen Brothers movies are always twice as good on screen as they are in script form, and this is therefore going to be an all-time right. classic film, and that is correct. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I'm looking at it right now. Joel, uh, I think this is up there Joel with, said he hadn't even seen him act. Like, he didn't right. know he was an actor. Uh, this is up there with It's a Wonderful Life, Wizard of Oz. And Sullivan's Travels, it will be remembered forever right. as a classic romp road movie. This is Howdy Do That, so let's, I'm just calling it out, but we're going into Howdy Do That. Yeah, now. the only real uh-huh. important one that we haven't mentioned before uh, as a part of other things was um, uh, the sound design work in this. I mean, we talked a little been, bit about. It's all I've wanted to talk about this uh, whole time. I mean, it, not the. Not the music, the no. sound design. The actual sound design. The placement of sounds. Imagine, so, I mean, most people watching a movie don't notice editing unless it's really in your face. Mm-hmm. Imagine noticing, hey, this is this the best sound design I've ever heard? Yeah. Literally the sound effects placement, the way... <laughs> in during musical numbers they cut to different spaces and every space yep. is meticulously created by having all these blind characters and making so many songs central they cue you up to focus on sound and the sound design is breathtaking you, this is um, i don't i can just tell it's good you explain why <laughs> okay so the, let me take you shortly through the history of sound design which is that Uh-oh. it started it started off kind of as just like what you see on camera is represented. Represented, Like if you see a fly you see, and it buzzes away, make the buzz sound. So it was always about the truth of what was on the picture. The diagesis. And then we started, then we, we got into kind of like the late, late 80s, early 90s, Jurassic Park was kind of one of the first ones to do it, which is they completely do digital soundtracks. So now, now it wasn't about a four track, now in an analog situation. You can literally make as many as your hard drive can take layers of sounds on top of each other. And people got crazy with this. Um, you know, like it's, it's a whole fascinating topic, but what's relevant mm. here is that people didn't know how to use it until I think the Coen brothers started using it. And there's a, there's an example of it about how they use chorus work in this movie. Uh, if you look at the, when the congregation is singing, let's go down to the river to pray. The camera's following the actors, meaning it's kind of showing all of the supporting roles of the people who are just a part of the congression, but it's also as like Delmar and Pete walk closer to the river. Mm -hmm. So the first thing that I think sound designers started to use sound design as is let's just make a more rich kind of like background bed of like you can hear the lapping of the sounds of the river. You can hear, you know, the wind going through the trees. That's how they decided, okay, we have this now infinite nonlinear space of editing that we can use in sound design. These guys come in and they're like, wow, this is great. We can really use this digital aspect of things uh, to, to play with things like balance, like coming out of the left or coming out of the right. Uh, speaker or just like how loud something is based on what's on on screen, they're the first ones to do this kind of thing where as the camera dollies through a few times, the actual mix of the song of uh, Let's Go Down to the River of Prey changes because if you see like an old woman and then it dollies for, for back a little bit and then you see a young girl. Her voice doll- diminishes and hers comes exactly. in. Exactly. Yeah. So we have this kind of thing that would never happen in like a single that just plays right. like in, in back when it was in just studio. like Elvis pitch or right. Elvis pictures or, or if any you just musical, copy and pasted the song into the timeline. Yeah, yeah. It became now this orchestra of like what we see, but also ways in which we can remix this completely like versatile, like almost infinite number of things that we could hear in the scene. And oh boy, when you talk about what if it's non-diegetic and disjointed, because right. I think one of the best things about film as a medium and why it's the supreme medium is it's actually a, an attention control machine. Right. Because you can go, yeah, we're hearing a woman cry, 
bitterly, but we're slowly zooming in on a broken tricycle. And that's really stupid, but you're like, oh, yeah. a kid got hit by a car. Yeah. It's making your brain connect dots and put thoughts together so they can do things like, again, my favorite is when they're singing down in the valley, you got to go alone, lonesome. <laughs> it's really diegetic. You hear the... Yeah. Uh, it seems like their voices are at the proper distance that the camera right, is. Right. You hear the grit of it being bouncing off trees. You hear it interrupted by their shovel dragging a tiny bit. Then when the flood comes in, their singing continues and becomes studio perfect like it was on the soundtrack. And there's no that's not what would happen if the space no, flooded, yeah. but it's the moment they wanted to create. So now they have infinite moments they can create because it doesn't have to be a real. It doesn't have to be diegetic. Right. Usually in the like and they even use that tactic in like uh, at the beginning of the film when it's like it's just a bunch of people picking at stones mm -hmm. because of the chain gang. And then sometimes it's a close up of the rock being broken that would have a different sound. Movies were doing this at this time. I mean, blockbuster right. movies were very good at this. But I would, I would, I'm guessing that I can't, because I can't think of one, and I kind of know what I'm talking about, but mm. I, I would no ask one that knows the audience. the totality of all film. Yeah. yeah, that specific to this kind of thing where we have this idea of montage in the middle of a shot. In other words, the sound design changes inside the shot based on where things are things that are being introduced to the frame and exiting frame and that kind of dance of sound mix. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I can't find a lot of movies that use it to this extent, or at least definitely not throughout the film uh, at this level. So these guys really upped the game of sound design. And I believe it did win the Oscar for sound design. I'm not, I don't no. know. I don't know. I looked it up and I found the answer, but I want to make sure I'm not <laughs> citing the opposite of what it I learned. It definitely didn't win from c cinematography, which as we talked about with, uh, in the case of Roger Deakins, he finally got Yeah, it. you're right. No, it, it wasn't, it didn't win any. It was only nominated for adapted screenplay, which is crazy to me mm -hmm. because if this, yes, it says at the beginning, this is an adaptation of the Odyssey. This is an original <laughs> screenplay. This is not in the category of adapted It's film. not adapted. This is not true grit, motherfuckers. Yeah. Um, and best cinematography, <laughs> which, of course, when it's Deacons, it's always a nom and never a win. It's, well, I mean... Uh, Until. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. He gets uh, shafted a lot. The, it's... There's so many crazy elements of uh, about Craftsman that you, are working yeah, you, on this team that it's just... That Pete, Fargo is one of their best films, sure. but it's just insane to me how like every year there's only a few years with cinematography with Deacons right. where I'm like like the t where next year yeah. with Man Who Wasn't There is a superbly shot film, but I get how it lost to Catching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. Sure, you know, <laughs> yeah, this this year, Tiger was a lot it. harder to make. I don't I'm get sure. this year. Yeah, I agree. Oh, brother should be way more represented in the Oscars, but Oscars have been and always yeah. will be full of shit. Surprisingly, very subdued in terms of camera moves in this movie versus other Coen Brothers and films. And yet the frame is so groomed and meticulous. Yeah, yeah. it's all postcards and brilliant uh, wides and then dialogue, but there isn't like, it's not like Barton Fink where it like moves around and is a character almost. And wasn't is, this one yeah. of the first feature films edited in Final Cut or Premiere? Um, well, the, the it got no. I think it was just color corrected digitally. I thought they it, had to do a telecine, which is a name for just making a Xerox copy, essentially, of every every film frame into a digital space. They yeah, had no. to do that. To, oh, brother, where art thou? Is arguably the most famous movie ever edited on Final Cut Pro. Oh wow. It yeah. was actually edited, edited on Final in the Cut program Pro. Final Cut Pro. Well, people were working on Avid, which is also digital which for was, a while, but yes. Final Cut Pro is like, that's a market disturber. It's a market disturber, and it was the first, uh, without getting too in the weeds, it, it works differently than Avid in a way that invites you to think differently, as Abe said. Yeah, It makes true. you think more like Photoshop does or more like a music producer where you're thinking in tracks and layers and opacity of effects on various mm -hmm. layers. And I really think in this movie, you can literally feel 
the Coen brothers being so excited about the future of like they're I wonder. they're playing hard with Final Cut Pro because they're just like, whoa, look at all this shit yeah, we can do. It's like a new paradigm. Yeah. So I, I think that's part of why the sound editing is so flawless. It they was their first were meticulous. time. It was their first time with a new sound editing toy. So they're like, this is awesome. Well, yeah. But you owe it to yourself to watch this movie thinking about all the sound because the sound is unparalleled even in their canon yeah, i think it's the best uh, listen to it with some headphones if you can mm. if not uh just turn that shit up it's a, it's not only b- brilliant music but it's also just like very meticulous they they take music they take sound away from you at times and you go like oh shit something's really wrong in a way yep. that is different Masterful. than the way that most horror movies do it where mm. it's just like the right amount of pause means that you're going to get yeah. uh, like a monster coming out. Well, horror movies now are even worse. They just discovered that sound that makes you feel uncomfortable. Right, and they're like, right. play the uncomfort sound. Yeah, <laughs> Apply uncomfort. Uh, but yeah, uh, I think that there's a lot of really good digital craftsmen yeah. work here that is never really talked about, about how this really cut the mold in both, di- like both video and sound Yes, was doing stuff that other groups even on the hollywood like blockbuster level weren't even doing craft wise oh brother is a pioneer and and they stepped everything the fuck up and movies have never been the same like it it had more of an impact than fargo i'm not saying it's better you could argue all day but fargo is more traditional oh brother like Mm -hmm. raised the bar in a way that's still felt um i got random how do you do that or trivias if you will man of constant sorrow also first written and published by a blind man. I just think there's something about blindness in this movie. Yeah. So, because I think they are like, close your eyes and listen to the movie. But then it's so great to look at, too. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there's one thing that uh, Evil Dead from earlier podcasts we've mentioned about how Sam Raimi and the Coen brothers tied at uh, the hip at NYU uh i think you guys will notice that everett mcgill's childhood at home at the end of the film uh where they go to search for and is submerged uh, in Mm -hmm. the flood it looks surprisingly like the evil dead's cabin and sam raimi's like their butt buddy forever and uh (laughs) joel cohen was the assistant editor on that film and it was his first feature so uh sam raimi's in head sucker i could just be a tiny little homage to each other Definitely, I could see it, yeah. Oh, yeah. And it's funny that they destroy it immediately. Yeah, they immediately destroy <laughs> Fuck it. Fuck you, Sam Raimi. Fuck like you, Sam Raimi. Um, my favorite anecdote was George Clooney did not immediately get his character. Like, he didn't feel that he knew how to do the Missouri or Mississippi cadence properly. So he sent it to his Uncle Jack, who grew up in the Deep South and spent his entire life in the Deep South, and had him record all the lines on tape and sent them back. Mm-hmm. And he memorized the lines by listening to the tape over and over. So, first of all, the cadence is great, and we owe a lot of credit to his Uncle Jack, but also on the first day of shooting into a scene, or I guess probably rehearsal day, uh, the Coens were like, what, you don't swear anymore? You can't say damn? It turned out his Uncle Jack had cleaned... Like he cleaned up the language, yeah. He made it like inoffensive to God and cut out all the swears and like anything objectionable. so cute. He like edited it. so cute. And uh, the first time that... Uncle Jack ever flew in a plane was to go to the premiere of Oh Brother Where Art Thou. Oh, Uncle Jack. Jack Jack Clooney. (laughs) Jack Clooney. Um, I guess two last, or one last thing. Sure, um, then we'll close out. We're at 220. Yeah, man. Uh, So, Joel Cohen revealed that this film was obviously inspired by The Wizard of Oz. Um, But what's crazy is that I want you to I want you to think about this. I don't need you to answer it because it throws it in the face of what we're kind of like our version of the Coen Brothers. What if the movie's the opposite of what we just said? In an interview on September fourteenth, two thousand nine, of GQ, Joel Cohen said, "All we've been doing for the last twenty five years is remaking The Wizard of Oz. It's true. Sometimes consciously, sometimes we don't realize it until we've made the movie." Oz is the only film we ever just rip off right and left. The way I'm going to respond, well, maybe, maybe they're, they're not saying we chose to be, like we said, let's make this movie our career. Yeah. They're saying it just happens, right? Right. Um, I'm going to answer by way of loading up, and I do think we should start mentioning this on podcast. 
our incredible Cohen Brothers Brothers shirt, uh, now available at the Small Bean store, which, well, I just realized no one, at any given time, Twitter, only a couple people are seeing that shit. Yeah. So I want to let the people know we have opened a store, a merch store. This is a spontaneous plug, not planned. Abe can back me up on that. Yeah. Smallbeans.bigcartel.com. And uh, we really, it's not just a cash grab. We put a lot of creative work into it, and so did a lot of great artists. And there's some truly hilarious shirts there, but the one I'm concerning myself with now is the Clothing Brothers Brothers, which has our awesome logos all lined up, so I know the Coen Brothers movie's in order. And I'm going to go through this with that in mind. Blood Simple is not the Wizard of Oz. Raising Arizona arguably is, could be the Wizard of Oz. Mm. Miller's Crossing, what do you think? I think it could be the Wizard of Oz. Components, yeah. Yeah. Barton Fink is the Wizard of That's Oz. That's definitely the Wizard of he Oz. He goes to a magical world. Hudsucker's definitely Wizard of Oz. Uh, Fargo, I don't really see as much as uh, Wizard no. of Oz. There's no group. Everyone's so alienated. Lebowski, <laughs> yeah. Lebowski is Wizard of Oz. Oh, Brothers Wizard this of one, Oz. This one, yeah. Man, it wasn't there. I think... I don't know what Act that is. Act three. The, yeah, We're going to talk about that one. Intolerable Cruelty is not. It's no. a screwball comedy for sure. Lady Killers is a bizarre one-off that we'll discuss when we get there. Uh-huh. No Country? Adaptation. Doesn't count. It you, doesn't. <laughs> you couldn't say it's based on The Wizard of Oz. It's based on No Country for Old Burn Men. Burn After Reading? I don't know. Burn After Reading. Serious Man is The Wizard of Oz. There's a giant tornado. There's a giant tornado in it. That must be true. True Grit's The Wizard of Oz kind of... Lewin Davis is the Wizard of Oz. Hail Caesar's Hail, Wizard of Oz. Fucking hey, yeah. So Vonnegut said there's only seven stories, and the one that he said is the most ripped off is Cinderella. And of course, Cinderella is not the original. What, some caveman probably came up with it. But the idea that someone is good and they don't deserve a bad life, and then there's a lot of hope, and then it goes away, and then at the end, by the skin of their teeth, it comes back and they do get the happy ending. Right. Um, what Wizard of Oz would be, person who's down on their luck is thrown into a crazy new world, learns to navigate it, becomes powerful in that world. It's into the woods. And it's finds their way A-B-A home. A-B-A prime. Comes, yeah. back to, comes back with a change. And but I also think they're referring to the fact of like they have so many powerful characters who are pretense. Mm-hmm. Like they do, they do the trick so often of, Build someone up, build someone up. They're not what they appeared to be, which mm-hmm. is, of course, the Wizard of Oz punchline. And they love, look, there's a goal. Ragtag group of three things are going to go to the goal. The yellow brick road will meander around and adventures will occur. That's the thing now, that I was pointing out is the, kind of what you were saying. They like the serial. Chapters. They like chapters. Just like, and then another thing happens. Another thing. Like it's Fargo not, stands out because it's not that. Because right. it goes in one direction. It definitely, yeah. And they all have act ones, two, threes. But it's like it, it just feels like um, in the same way that they're really good at noir. Because noir is just a bunch of random circumstances. Well, let's just go to the... Let's just go to the bar and see what happens. Well, then we're going to learn about this other yeah. crazy thing that's happening. Oh, Lebowski is Wizard of Oz for sure. Oh, yeah. I, I bet that's the one that he was meant when he said, sometimes yeah. it just turns out that way. Because I feel like they probably read that and went, oh, Lebowski oh, is Wizard of Oz. Wizard yeah. Of Oz. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I, I thought that was an interesting quote just because... Really? For sure. I don't think of when I think of like the catalog of things that I'm even interested in, not like necessarily things I make, I don't think of them as all boiling under one, but maybe no, they no, do. No. I they, think have they have versatility to. for yeah. sure. But it kind of makes me wonder, Buster Scruggs, of course, is the closest to flirting with this, but mm-hmm. maybe I, and I never thought I'd say this. Maybe I do want to see like a three season TV series from the Coen brothers. Mm-hmm. Like, well, Maybe they want to be episodic. Why don't they try right, it? Like, right. why don't they actually try episodes? Well, I mean, with Fargo, every season, the the per, like the showrunner the always Fargo. tries to find three Coen Brothers movies that they can nod at, and say like, let's Ugh. have that moment. For, like, there's you know, which is random and not really I what the Coen talk, Brothers would do. I want to talk about that next episode for Man Who Wasn't There. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good one. Uh, in, until then, but until then, I yeah. think we should sing. Yeah. Ha, 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 
to old Kentucky, a place where I was born and raised. <laughs> I was a place where he was born and raised. Whoa, 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 whoa. Hey, everybody, Swaim here. With added excitement in my voice because it might equate to money for me. Uh, I just wanted to officially let everyone know through the medium of audio rather than tweets that Small Beans has a merch store now. Yeah, that's right. And this is not just some cash grab with the logos of our shows, although you can get logo tees there if you'd like. We worked very hard with several very talented artists to really present you with shirts and buttons and content to come that we really think is worth your purchase and you're going to enjoy. And if you're someone who hasn't been able to patronize us, this is a fantastic way to support Small Beans directly without having to sign up for Patreon. And of course, you get a physical item in return rather than just our glorious, glorious content, which will remain free, but is not free to make. So we'd really appreciate anyone who's willing to check out the SB merch store. It is at smallbeans.big cartel.com and there you will find a bunch of hilarious shirt designs some limited edition buttons as well as an ever increasing amount of audio content to download we're talking original rap songs audiobook versions of short stories and so on and we're always brainstorming and trying to add new things to the shop but we'll stop if no one goes there so please check it out smallbeans.bigcartel.com and as always we love you